so I just at this point kind of assume our legislators won't be here. So that's that'd be eight people we're missing. Wait, oh Bennett too. No, it was Helen, Helen Bassett. Sorry. I, I panicked when I saw I it came in Bassett Helen. And I was like, oh no, Bennett's not gonna be here. Um, do you do the legislators usually let us know or are we just listening? Because I think this half is of last week a, they're in session or something. Yeah, two of two of them occasionally let me know. Two of them I never hear from. They just don't show up. So, um, but eight that puts us at fifteen. So if anybody, like, yeah. it's a little what precarious. What is quorum? Uh, quorum is twelve. 13? Twelve. Okay. Yeah, that's uh, half would well. Half would be a fraction, but. Well, good thing we're only voting on something early on. I guess if we yeah. don't have a quorum, we won't be able to vote on the chair rolls. We have the old uh, staff slide in the presentation. Which, uh, I thought it was updated. It's got Carrie on there. Not the one that's on, unless Stace, unless Stacy managed to change it. The one like that's kind of at the top of the mural um, no. that Stacy that like we just keep going back to uh, is not updated. But I did. I emailed Stacy yesterday to let her know. So because I don't know how to swap out the. So it's this one. Oh, yeah. And I'm we'll have, you know. We'll have to update it anyway when we add a vice chair, when, you know, for the for next month anyway, because we'll have a vice chair to add. So, yeah. Is that locked or I guess it's just an image on there? Yeah, it's an image. And I don't um, I don't know, like what all the steps are that we have to do to. I'll just skip it. Kari's going to introduce herself anyway, so. As long as it's up, it's updated in the meeting documents anyway, so that should be fine. Yes, point. true. That is, you're absolutely correct. Oh, Nick, I'm going to make you co-host. Hey, Stefan. Good morning, morning Stefan. I wish I could get rid of all these messages from, like you're sharing your screen. The meeting is streaming on YouTube. I'm, I, I'm aware of that. I'm the one who started it. Hey, Carolyn. Jessica, Jessica, do you know how to pronounce uh, Dom Dominique's last name? Um, let me see. I haven't heard it before. I was just going with uh, Mandola. Is that? I don't want to mess anybody up. Mendiola. Oh, Mendiola. I knew that wasn't right. What I had in my head. Hey, Paula. Welcome, everyone. I know we're still live streaming, but we're just sort of getting, <laughs> waiting for everyone to join, uh, making sure we get a quorum, and we'll get started probably shortly after 9.30. But welcome, Paula, Caroline, Stefan. Good morning. Good morning. Jessica, I don't know if you saw my response this morning, but we have, uh, so Paula, you shared some feedback, Courtney did, Margaret did, um, 
some of that is uploaded to the team's channel right now. Uh, Paula years went out with the meeting materials. Um, so I'm trying to get that all kind of gathered in one place um, in the public engagement folder on the team's channel for everyone to access. Yeah, I saw that. Um... I don't know that I want to read all of that stuff from, from each person, especially. Oh, no. <laughs> um, I think just having it kind of in that folder, um, it might be good to know if folks are able to access that folder on Teams. Yes. Because um, that's a treasure trove of, of good information about public feedback. I haven't had anyone come to me and tell me they can't access it, but that doesn't mean folks have, that doesn't mean everyone has actually tried to access it yet, so. Welcome, Adam. Good morning. Just trying to get Mural working here. Do you have all the, the link and password? I can put it in the chat if you don't. I do have it. Yeah, handy. I ran into the CAPTCHA thing. Um, uh -oh. where it wants me to identify a motorcycle and oh, great. apparently I'm struggling with that. So I will try again. Actually, you know what, if you could put it in the chat, that would be awesome. Jess, that would be okay. huge. Just thank you. Not a problem. Yeah, no, at all. I think I have the password saved copied and pasted. Where did I do. My chat so go? I just need the link. There we go. Thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. Welcome Ari and Rep Smith is joining us. How nice. We need four more task force members to get to our quorum. No, we'll get there. Morning, everyone. Morning, Good Ari. Morning. And for those watching on the live stream, we're just waiting for uh, folks to join. People are slowly trickling in, and then we'll we'll go ahead and get started with this month's meeting. Thanks for tuning in. Hey, everybody. This is Rep Smith. Um, since we have a moment before we have forum, just want to apologize in advance. We do a floor session today, so I'm sure many of us elected officials will be in and out and unavailable for large portions, but, but uh, I'll be here as long as I can. So uh, glad where this work is continuing. Thank you, Rep Smith. Glad to have you here. Welcome, David and Carrie. Waiting on three more folks for quorum. I've got an extra screen up today, so I've got I have three screens going right now. Yes, and everyone, uh, Stacy's not here today, so I'm going to, I'm running tech and facilitating, so please uh, be patient with me. Thank you, Jess. We appreciate that. Stacy. Stacy's off celebrating uh, her birthday. Yeah. A nice uh, trip, uh, enjoying that on a vacation. So thank you so much, Jess, for taking over. All right, looks like we've also got Renji that's joined us and one of, and our guest speaker, Dominique. Welcome, Dominique. Welcome, Renji. Just waiting for a quorum to get started. Maybe we need two more people. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure it says it on your screen, but we are, we did start streaming a while ago. Donovan is here, so we need one more member to start.
For those just tuning in, we're just uh, waiting for a little bit to get um, our members to join to make sure we have a quorum because we have a few things we need to vote on at the beginning of the meeting today. So just sit tight and we'll get started in a few minutes. Thanks for watching. Oh, and Jill's here. <clears throat> so we do have quorum. We can get started. Welcome, everyone, to the May meeting of the Psychedelic Medicine Task Force. Um, I just said a couple of minutes ago before everyone, uh, before we had everyone, um, Stacy is out today. So I am going to be facilitating and running tech. So please bear with me um, if I'm juggling uh, some extra stuff today. Um, so just a reminder, cameras on if you um, if it works for you and you're feeling comfortable with that. Um, use the hand raise feature if you want to jump into the conversations that we'll be having. Uh, the chat feature is turned off. You can chat with uh, the co-host, the co host myself, co-host Nick, if you need to. Um, but in uh, <clears throat> For transparency reasons, uh, the, the chat is off for chatting between members um, since we're streaming and no one can see what's going on in the chat if they're not on Zoom. Uh, we're going to be using Mural again today. The link and password are in the chat for those who need it. Um, it's also should be in your meeting invite and um, the reminder emails that I sent out last week. And also, welcome to our observers. Um, got a little screen here for you all. Uh, the meeting is being live streamed on YouTube. That's probably how you're seeing us. Um, welcome on behalf of the Minnesota Department of Health and the MAD staff and our task force chair, Dr. Justin Nielsen. Um, the meeting, again, is uh, open meeting law requires that the public be able to attend the meeting, but do not require the meetings to be recorded uh, or preserved. Um, and I have Kari Glavin from uh, the Minnesota Department of Health, who is going to um, tell us a little bit more about uh, MDH's decision on that. Um, and Kari is also taking over for Dana Farley and will be with us going forward. Yes, good morning. Um, it's so great to be here. So yeah, my name is Kari Gloffin and I work in the same section at MDH as Dana Farley and Carolyn Johnson. Um, and so just to update on the what we decided about the um, recording and saving the recordings of the meetings, um, in order to post, uh, I've learned that nothing is ever as simple as you wish, but in order to post things online as a state agency, we have to go through some additional steps to make sure that it's accessible and um, can be viewed by anybody. Uh, so we just don't have the, the staff or funding to do it right now. So um, there's nothing stopping others from recording it and saving it um, elsewhere, but we just aren't able at this point to do that <clears throat> on our side. Um, so I'm happy to answer any questions about it or and you can feel free to email me as well. It's good to be here. I'm sorry to start with that bad news, but. Thank you, Kari. Do any of the members have any thoughts or feedback or questions for Kari about that before we move on? Okay, hearing none, I guess we'll move on. Jess, do you wanna keep running through? Absolutely. Uh, so a reminder of our legislative charge. Uh, we, the Psychedelic Medicine Task Force was established to advise the legislature on the legal, medical and policy issues associated with the legalization of psychedelic medicine in the state. For the purposes of this work, psychedelic medicine means MDMA, psilocybin and LSD. Um, Again, the 
task force is surveying existing studies of scientific literature, comparing efficacy of psychedelic medicine in specific instances, and developing a comprehensive plan for the legislative for legislative review. Um, so these two slides here that we've gone through kind of uh, give an overview of that. And so we are ready. That's a, our kind of background information. So welcome again. Uh, I know we've had a few members join since I started talking. Um, welcome. We have quorum. We can actually uh, do our roll call and voting on things. So um, I am going to start roll call. Uh, we're at first names. Um, just, you know, say, let me know that you're here when I call your name. Um, I know Courtney is absent. Helen is absent. Guthrie is absent. Uh, Julia. Paula. Here. Thanks. Jeremy. Stefan. Here. Margaret is absent. Bennett. Here. Dave. Here. Nick. Ari. Here. Kelly. Jessica. Here. Kit. Here. Jill. I'm here. Good morning. Good morning. Ken. I'm here. Donovan. Here. Andy. Here. Michael. Here. Adam. Here. Ranji. Here. And Nolan. All right. Okay, next up, uh, minutes approval or meeting summary approval for April. Jessica, I can hand that over to you. Yeah, thanks. So um, everyone should have received the meeting summary minutes from our April task force meeting. So hopefully everyone has had time to review those those minutes to determine whether they're an accurate reflection of what we talked about in April. Um, so we do want to open it up for discussion if there's any corrections or edits or clarifications um, that need to be made to the April uh, meeting minutes before we move forward and um, approve the meeting minutes through a, a vote by roll call. Um, so does anybody want to come on mic and camera um, with any issues they want to change about the April meeting minutes before we proceed to vote on approving the minutes? All right, hearing uh -huh. none. Uh, well, oh, did someone have something to say? Or was that you, Jess? That was me. Sorry. So so hearing none, assuming everyone um, has read the minutes and understand uh, what we said, obviously, if you weren't at the April meeting, you, sh you should abstain um, from voting to approve the minutes. But um, we'll just do a vote by roll call. First, do I have a motion to approve the meeting minutes? So a motion to approve the meeting movements minutes. Okay, uh, so I think that was Renji. I'll second. Renji and Bennett. Had a motion in a second. All right, so I'll turn it back over to you, Jess, to do a vote by roll call for the approval. All right. Of the minutes. Okay. Uh, Courtney is absent. Helen is absent. Guthrie, Julia, Paula. Approve. Uh, Jeremy, I guess, is coming, but he is not. Uh, I just was able to oh. join by mobile. My computer is restarting. Perfect. Uh, we're voting to uh, approve the April minutes. Approve. Stefan. Approve. Margaret is absent. Bennett. Yes. Dave. Um, sorry. Um, I need to abstain because I wasn't okay. here last time. Thank you. Thanks. 
Nick is not here yet. Ari. Approve. Kelly is absent. Jessica. Yes, approve. Kit. Yes. Jill. Approve. Ken. I was not at the last meeting. Thank you. Donovan. Approve. Andy. I was not able to attend the whole meeting. I'll abstain. Thank you. Michael. Approve. Adam. Approve. Ranchi. Approve. And Nolan is absent. All right. Thanks, everyone. Next up, we have uh, our member collected feedback, and I will turn it back over to Jessica to give a little overview of that. Yeah, thank you so much. So um, some of us on the task force hold um, public listening sessions to be able to gather feedback from the public on what they want to see um, a potential psychedelic medicine program look like here in Minnesota. Um, and so I, I hold some for the psychedelic community and, and other people kind of more pro psychedelics and the consistent feedback I hear from members of the public is, you know, wanting to have less restrictions around access, particularly around, you know, not only having the option of it being in a medicalized setting and really having a more broad net cast around access, both for, um, potential clinicians and therapists that might want to utilize this, as well as people wanting to um, seek this out for therapy or other uses. Um, so it seems that folks are really kind of honing in on, on you know, sort of less restrictions and more access. Um, but that's just one kind of small sap snapshot of the public perception um, from kind of the psychedelic community that I have ties to. Um, so I do want to get some feedback from others. So if anyone else in the community, I know Paula um, shared her feedback in a written report. Paula, I don't know if you want to come on camera and kind of summarize some of that for folks. And if others have feedback they want to share from their communities, um, go ahead and raise your hand and we can get a cue going uh, to kind of give a brief overview of what folks from the public and the different seats that you represent have to say about what we're doing um, and what the priorities are and concerns for psychedelic medicine um, here in Minnesota. Thank you, Jessica. I'll speak briefly. Um, I surveyed my colleagues, my friends, and then I just put a really broad uh, solicitation out there on LinkedIn for Minnesotans, if anybody wanted to weigh in. Uh, there was probably about a dozen folks, uh, maybe a little more than that, that responded. Overwhelmingly, there was support uh, for um, broader access, both in a medical or clinical setting, as well as uh, adult regulated use. There were two people that had concerns. Um, well, I should say three. Uh, one was a psychiatrist and his concern was just about the lack of, of kind of rigorous studies regarding uh, the therapeutic medicinal use, uh, particularly because it's hard to um, manage placebos because people are pretty, are pretty clear that whether they're receiving psychedelic medicine or not. So he was concerned about just the, some of the efficacy uh, in terms of the studies um, or the reliability of the studies. Uh, so uh, he's a scientist. Um, there was a therapist that had some concerns about um, the kind of spiritual um, uh, you know, integration with, with uh, clinical settings and some so very much a support of decrim or legalization or broader access uh, for adults, but didn't see uh, psychedelics necessarily as being useful in the psychotherapeutic space related to the concern about, again, spirituality and in that integrating there. And then there was one concern about uh, legalization versus decrim, and that legalization maybe opened up more pathways for exploitation. Um, uh, yeah, just uh, that the, the, the decrim versus full legalization might might provide more safeguards, but that was those were the, the concerns. Otherwise, there was overwhelming support for um, uh, pretty broad access, uh, both from uh, adult regulated and medicinal therapeutic use. Thank you, Paula, for collecting that and sharing that with us. Does anybody else have any uh, feedback from their communities they'd like to share? Yeah, Ari? Ari, do you want to go ahead? Yeah, thanks. 
Um, I circulated a survey anonymously to people in the harm reduction community. So um, policy people, um, academic people, docs, uh, people who use drugs and all of the different combinations of those people, of those identities within the harm reduction space. Um, I've only gotten a few responses back. I just put it out into the field like on Thursday, but broadly the responses I've gotten are, yes, I have used these medicines to treat all manner of anxiety, depression, PTSD, et cetera. They've been extremely effective for me in coping with childhood trauma. Um, I would advocate for all kinds of access, as wide access as possible to these medicines and that um, that there should be attention to the harms of criminalization, um, you know, in line with harms associated with criminalizing cannabis and um, other illicit drugs. Thanks. Thank you so much, Ari, for collecting that and sharing that with us. Anyone else have anything to share from their listening sessions or feedback? I did get a document from Courtney over the weekend um, that she's not here today to cover it, but it is uploaded in the uh, public engagement folder on the task forces teams channel. So um, you can go there to look at it. Uh, I believe we have some feedback coming in from Margaret at some point. Um, and also this is just a reminder. Um, if you, if any of you are having trouble accessing the teams channel, please let me know. And I can work with you on that to get you a, make sure you have access. Thank you, Jess. All right, Renji. Yeah. I, uh, yeah, I do. I have a document. Um, that is sort of semi-prepared. I'd like to give a little bit more time for some of my colleagues. I specifically asked for psychiatrists, but non-psychiatrist uh, mental health providers as well to uh, to make a comment about them. And once I do that, I'll upload that into the uh, document. Awesome. Thank you so much, Renji. Anyone else before we move on? Uju, this is Donovan Sather, uh, Red Lake. Um, I've been doing small reach uh, to our spiritual leaders and just talking about what this uh, natural plant medicine, um, I think like it's the re-remembering of what it means and what it is. And I think we really need to do a lot of uh, some educational sessions to really broaden people's awareness and understanding uh, because uh, I'm coming across a lot of, um, without being in the in the psychedelic community or connected to it, there's a lot of disconnection and understanding besides recreational use. So I think what would be beneficial for, for doing more outreach in native community is being able to provide some of that education so we can help them understand this is uh, what I think would be, and it's only my personal opinion, is that, that therapeutic practice and um, so that's kind of where I am right now in doing some research and the outreach to our communities. Miigwech. Much, Donovan. All right, anyone else before we move on? All right. Um, so just moving forward, if folks want to do these listening sessions or reach out to your communities, your departments, if you're state appointed and just um, gather some feedback around some of these things that we're discussing, um, hoping to have a lively conversation today around uh, psilocybin. Um, so stay tuned for that. Uh, but now we're going to move on if there's no other feedback from uh, members um, in terms of who you've talked to from listening sessions. And we're going to move on to do um, a nomination and voting for a vice chair role and working group chair roles. So I've been serving as the chairperson since November um, when you all elected me. Thank you for that. Um, and just noticing that it would be good to have um, a little bit more leadership uh, working kind of behind the scenes in between meetings to help get things together and also to help facilitate not only this main task force meeting, but also having folks appointed to, to um, help run the working groups for the legal and regulatory and policy working groups. Um, and so we're going to do, we're going to turn over to Mural and do a little exercise. So first, um, we have a couple candidates for the vice chair um, that have been nominated by various people. So Bennett and Ari <laughs> have been nominated as um, vice chair. 
Um, so first, we would just want to get a sense of whether Ben and Ari, if you both accept this nomination and whether you want to be voted on uh, to serve this role and would be willing to serve that role. And for those that um, want to review the task force uh, or the vice chair and working group chair um, roles and responsibilities, those are also in mural next to the uh, relevant sections. So if you want to nominate somebody or put their name in one of the boxes, um, and then I do want to hear from those that have been nominated to see if you accept the nomination and um, what your thoughts are on that before we move to a vote. Uh, hi, yes, um, I'm I'm happy to be nominated and, and happy to be considered. Thank you. Thank you, Bennett. Yes, likewise, thank you for the nomination. All right, thank you. Um, so do we have any other nominations talk about the nominees for the vice chair and the working groups, and then we're going to do a vote by roll call for all three positions. Um, so you'll state who you're voting for for each of those three positions when we do the vote by roll call. So are there any more nominations for vice chair at this time? Nominate Paula. Paula, Paula, do you accept a nomination for vice chair? You're muted. Paula, you're oh, muted. Sorry. sorry, yes. I was just saying, um, I have an interest in uh, the chairperson for the legal work group, and so I'm going to decline the nomination, but thank you. Thank you, Paula. All right, we'll have your name over on the legal working group chair. All right, so moving on to um, the legal working group chair. So we have, so Ari, would you rather be only nominated for vice chair, or do you also want to be nominated for working group chair? I'll hedge my bets and keep my name in for legal working group as well. Okay. So right now we have Ari and Paula nominated for the legal working group chair. Are there any other nominations for the legal group working chair? Legal working group chair. Just kidding. I'm going to take my name out. I think it will be make it too complicated for voting. Just strike me from legal working group. Okay. That sounds good. All right. So anyone else? All right, and do we have any nominations for the regulatory working group? Chair. Sure. Currently, there's no one. I nominate Adam. Adam, do you accept that nomination? Um, I, I wasn't planning to seek the nomination. Uh, I do have some concerns about bandwidth. I'm president of my labor union and this year is a contract negotiation year. So I'm not sure I'm the best person to do it just in terms of available time. I really appreciate the nomination, uh, but ultimately I do believe I need to decline. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Appreciate that, Adam. Any other nominations? You can also self-nominate if you feel called to run the legal or the regulatory working group. I have a question. Can I ask yeah. a question? You know, I've been following the minutes of the regulatory work group and, and I actively participating in the legal, and it looks like there's so much overlap and the same small number of people participate. I'm just curious about um, if they could be combined somehow and maybe have subgroups within them or work groups within them, but uh, it feels like there's a lot of crossover. Yeah, I agree. Um... I mean, it might be that, you know, there's just sort of like one working group lead, because um, I think as our work evolves, like we're kind of focused on what is actually possible legally, and then we need to move on to all the regulations that would be implemented. So, yeah, that might make sense. Adam, do you have something to add? I, I would agree with Paula that at this point, the work that the legal group is doing and the work that the regulatory group is doing, I don't know how I would like distinguish them from each other. So. I would definitely support like one unified legal and regulatory group, or you could call it something else. Um, and we might need to meet, you know, more than once or twice a month, um, you know, would be going from two meetings a month for regulatory, two meetings a month for legal. I think in order to get this done, we're going to have to meet more often than that. But, uh, and I know it's a huge time commitment for people, uh, but I just, I, couldn't even describe the difference between the two at this point. 
And especially since a lot of the same people come to both. So I would be supportive of, you know, one combining legal and regulatory into a single work group. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. So I guess that, so is there any other nomination, self-nomination or otherwise for uh, sounds like a more broad working group lead or chair before we move on to a vote by roll call? <clears throat> Okay, hearing none at the moment, I think we'll move on to a, um, a vote by roll call for the vice chair role and the working group chair, um, knowing that now we've kind of understood that we'll have a single working group chair <laughs> uh, to manage both legal and regulatory. Um, so we have two candidates for the vice chair role, Bennett Hertz and Ari McHenry. And we have one nomination for the working group role, which is Paula. DeSanto. So we're going to um, do a, so do I have a motion to, to call a vote? Do I need to do that just to, to do a motion to vote for the chair, the vice chair role? I honestly don't know. Um, but I don't think we, I don't think we need to, I think we can just vote so I can just okay. start with the roll call. So I will call your name. Uh, you tell me who you are voting for. Uh, I'm going to go vice chair first and then work group chair. So uh, let's see, Courtney, Helen, Guthrie, Julia, Paula, you are actually here. Vice Chair. Ari. And Work Group Chair. Um, can I vote for myself? You I'm absolutely not... can. Oh, okay, I'll vote for me. Jeremy, Vice Chair vote. Jeremy off again. All right, Stefan, uh, who are you voting for for vice chair? Stefan, are you here to vote? It looks like he may have dropped off. I don't see him anymore. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Bennett. It looks like is next. Uh, I'll vote for myself and for uh, Paula for legal and regulatory. Thank you, Dave, Vice Chair. Um, I would vote for Bennett and Paula. Thank you. Nick, I see you are here now, or I did see. You. Yeah, sorry, it was a it was a, a computer issue. Um, yeah, I'll have Bennett and uh, Paula as well. That'd be great. Thanks. Thank you, Ari. I'll vote for myself and for Paula. Thank you. Kelly is absent. Jessica. I vote for Ari for vice chair and Paula for working group chair. Thank you. Kit, Vice Chair. Uh, Bennett and Paula. Thank you. Jill. I vote for Bennett and Paula. Thanks. Ken. Bennett and Paula. Donovan. Bennett and Paula. Andy. Bennett, Paula. Michael. Nicole, Ari, and Paula. Adam. Ari and Paula. Ranji. Bennett and Paula. Thanks. Uh, no one is absent. Did we, did Stefan come back? Stefan, uh, can we get your vote for the vice chair and for the work group chair? Paula and Bennett. Thank you. 
You want to try Jeremy one more time? Yes, Jeremy. Oh, wait. Jeremy's mic isn't working. Is it okay if he does it in the chat and I say it? I'm okay with I don't. that. Okay. Uh, got Bennett and Paula from Jeremy in the chat. Okay. Did I miss anyone? All right, so we have eleven for Bennett, two, four, five for Ari, and then Paula. We had a simple majority. Yes. Uh, yep. Twelve. What did I say? Twelve. Yeah. You said Bennett was eleven. Yes. And one, two, three, four, five for Ari. That sounds like Bennett. <laughs> Bennett's um, vote will carry um, as our vice chair. Uh, congratulations, Bennett. And then Paula as our working group chair. So congratulations to you both. Um, and thanks for being willing to step up and, and help us with our uh, task force duties. Um, so now we're going to move on to our next section. I just want to give a brief overview. Jess, if you want to show the screen that kind of goes over our meeting agenda today um, to talk about kind of things. Okay, so we already approved our meeting minutes and did member collected fe feedback and elected our vice chair and working group chairs. So now we're going to move on to a panel um, of subject matter experts that we've brought on. We have four uh, special guests joining us today. Um, so we have um, we have Dominic Mendiola, who is the Senior Director of Marijuana Enforcement uh, Division and Natural Medicine Division in Colorado, um, where they've recently legalized psilocybin um, and other natural uh, psychedelics and as well as decriminalized them. Um, we have Jason Ortiz from The Last Prisoner Project, uh, Mason Marks, who's kind of our returning special guest who helps us understand the legal landscapes around psychedelic legalization and legislation. And Emma Knighton, who is a therapist in Oregon, who was on the Washington State Task Force and also helped implement Measure 109. So I want to bring our special guests up on camera. Thank you so much, each of you, for joining. Um, we're going to give each of you about five minutes to um, come on camera and um, introduce yourself and um, speak to your talking points that you want to cover today. And then we're going to open things up for a Q&A with our members. Um, and so we will basically have an activity on mural while we're talking with um, our special guests. Um, so if you can orient yourself to the mural page um, on the left bottom side, if you can follow Jess um, down to that section in section um, three, <laughs> it looks like um, there is a table um, kind of similar to the table we worked on last month that's really kind of talking about the different options we're exploring. Um, one is, are we going to do more research? Are we going to have an adult regulated or a medical, a, a, a regulated medical program, a regulated non-medical program for decriminalization? And these things can happen together. They can, we can have just one, we can have a combination of, of a few of them or none of them. Um, so it's really up to us to figure out which of these we want to explore. Um, and each of the, the rows in this table is really kind of figuring out how would we implement these and kind of thinking about some questions that you might have for our, our guest speakers today as they've been working to implement this in Oregon and Colorado and kind of what this looks like from the context of regulating for equity as well and making sure that we're casting a broad net uh, to make sure that this is accessible and affordable and equitable. Um, so yeah, I want to bring on our, our, our special speaker. So I guess we'll all call on you by name to start. Um, so if uh, our first speaker wants to come on, our returning guest, Mason Marks, if you want to go ahead and um, say your piece first, and then I'll move on to Emma, and then Jason, and then Dominic. Sure. I was not expecting you to go first because you listed the order differently. 
uh, but it, I can do that. Um, you've probably heard a lot of what I was planning to say um, already, but I wanted to comment on some of the speakers that you heard from last month, uh, Ariel Clark and Christine DNDC, whose presentations I thought were excellent when it comes to equity. I mean, they were very much focused <clears throat> on equity. So I would encourage anyone who's thinking about that to rewatch both of those presentations. And I, I also want to praise you as a group for being what I think um, would be the, the, the group that's given these issues of accessibility and equity the most consideration of all the different, you know, there are many, many states now uh, that are looking into these issues, state legislatures, state agencies, um, task forces, working groups, advisory boards. <clears throat> and I think that um, they've looked into issues of, of accessibility and equity to various degrees, some um, very little or not at all. And, and um, you're an example, I think, of, of a group that's really thought about these things uh, quite deeply. And uh, I guess I should say who I am. Uh, so I'm Mason Marks. I'm a law professor at Florida State University College of Law. I'm also a visiting professor at Harvard Law School. And uh, for the last year, I've taught a course on psychedelic law at both Florida State and Harvard. And uh, I'm also the uh, senior fellow and project lead of the project on psychedelics law and regulation at the Petrie Flom Center at Harvard Law School. So I write and, uh, and uh, uh, think about state and federal and international regulation of controlled substances and psychedelics. Um, I wanted to say a little bit more about some things that Ariel Clark also mentioned you heard during her presentation about the cost of services in Oregon. And her estimate was $2,000 to $3,000 for a single dose of psilocybin. I usually say um, about 1500 to 3000 So I think our estimates are pretty close there. And so obviously that is not going to be accessible for very many people. And it's been documented so far that in Oregon, many, if not most of the clients that are seeking services are coming into the into Oregon from out of state. So this program has really created a, a psychedelic tourism industry more than than met the needs of, of of the program when that when when it was being introduced to the public. You also heard from Ariel that the program's very expensive and inaccessible for many aspiring business operators. And as a result of that, many have either gone out of business or they, and I'm including within that both um, facil uh, facilitators, service center operators, and uh, training program uh, uh, operators that have either gone out of business or changed their plans and decided not to go into the industry. So her advice to you, which I think is great advice when it comes to equity, is to make sure that your recommendations account for the cost, which I think she correctly pointed out, really was not taken into consideration in Oregon. And um, yeah, uh, Bennett. Uh, thanks, Mason. I just had a quick question. Apologies for interjecting. Um, is this, I'm assuming that the businesses in Oregon um, that are facilitating are having the same Section 280E problem that cannabis businesses are? And for people unfamiliar with the tax code, that's the portion of the tax code that says that businesses that uh, deal in Schedule One or Schedule Two controlled substances cannot write off their business expenses, um, as, and and so have to pay taxes on basically all of their 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 entire uh, income rather than just their profit, which which makes things much more expensive. I just wanted to ask about that since since you're talking about it. Sorry to again, sorry to interject. No, you're absolutely right. It's a great point. That is that is a significant factor in the cost and, and barriers to entry. 
uh, is the is the inability to deduct business expenses that traditionally a business would be able to um, deduct from their taxes, and that's because you can't deduct expenses related to uh, a Schedule One or Two controlled substance. And but but really, there there are many other factors as well. There's the cost of licensing, which is very expensive in Oregon, and I and I suspect will be equally expensive in Colorado, uh, as well as difficulty in, in getting banking services and finding um, a space for these facilities. One of my suggestions to you, which, which Ariel also mentioned, was to move away from the idea of having a dedicated facility, which accounts for a really significant portion of the cost and doesn't really make a lot of sense um, from any perspective, I mean, people will say that it's a safety measure, but I don't. I don't know that there's necessarily any evidence to suggest that that's uh, going to improve safety significantly. But it certainly adds substantially to the cost. Jessica, did you have a a question? Sorry. Yeah, I just want to uh, be mindful of time um, and and, yeah. and remind folks. So we're doing little five minute brief introductions so that each uh, guest speaker could could say their piece, and then we'll open up for a broader uh, Q and A with the members and a mural. Make one final point. I, this is just more related to Christine's presentation. Um, I think please listen to that presentation again. I think and and Ariel mentioned that in the California cannabis industry, the tribal populations were completely overlooked in the lawmaking process. Unfortunately, the same is true in Oregon. And I would say it's true, it, the lawmaking process, I would say that's true in Colorado as well, and largely the, the rulemaking process. And I, I have some things to say about that uh, tribal and indigenous working group, but uh, you can come back to me on that. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much, Mason. All right, we'll move on to Emma. You want to introduce yourself and your talking points? Thank you. Sure. Thanks, Jessica. <clears throat> Hello, everybody. I have a bit of a head cold, so if I'm a little sniffly, if that's what's going on. Um, but nice to meet you all. I'm based in Portland, Oregon, and I am a somatic drama therapist, a psychedelic assistant therapist, and do a lot of educating and policy work around the field. Um, in terms of this, the relevance is of me being here is that I'm currently the director of one of the psilocybin service centers in Portland um, called InnerTrek. And previously, I was the director of education at a psilocybin training program called Alma Institute. So I've got experience across a couple different areas of the implement implementation of Measure 109. And as Jessica said, I was on the Washington State Task Force for psilocybin a couple years ago. And that bill has not made it through yet, but they're still working on it. Um, so a couple of things that I want to say and kind of piggyback a little bit on what Mason said is that there's a big issue right now around accessibility. It is true that most people that are coming through service centers in Oregon are from out of state and even out of country. Um, and there's a lot of folks that have the money that are able to come. So the, the license fees are a really big issue. They're incredibly high here. Um, and that's because the license fees for service centers, for facilitators, for manufacturers, for training programs. And that's because the license fees are directly funding the um, OHA office that is working on all of the back end issues and, um, and implementation of Measure 109. So I would really suggest that y'all think about a potentially alternate way to fund the whatever is getting developed within the government system that's going to be looking at licensees, kind of holding the implementation of your bill, um, because that's a massive issue of access on the other end of people actually coming through the system. Um, the biggest thing that I wanted to recommend to y'all, I don't know where you're at with this, but is thinking about dual licensure of, for people who are licensed mental health professionals, licensed medical professionals. A big issue we have here in Oregon is that they did not allow for dual licensure. And so for me, like I'm a licensed therapist and I cannot be functioning under my therapist license and under a psilocybin license at the same time. And this poses a big risk for all of us who have licenses in the state or in other states. And it's causing a pretty significant, like bottleneck is the wrong word, but there's a lot of people who are not participating, who have the skills to participate, but because our license boards haven't given us the approval that they're not going to take away our licenses if we decide to work with a scheduled substance, um, because that the negotiation wasn't agreed upon ahead of time in the bill making process. The other issue around that is that we are treating people with mental 
the illnesses. Most of the people in our service center that come through are people who have treatment resistant depression, have PTSD, have long term anxiety. The most people are in the camp of I've tried everything else and are in the 45 to 70 age range where they've tried everything else, they have enough money to try this thing. But, you know, even if we have therapists on our staff, we can't do therapy with people because of this issue of dual licensure. People need longer term prep, people need longer term integration. And we're, we're working around it um, in different ways, but we have to be very strict about the license piece. Colorado is allowing for dual licensure. And so there's more space there. And this, and we are trying to update our bills, um, our rules in Oregon to allow for this. But please, please, please think about this ahead of time. It will save you a big headache down the road. Um, I would also encourage people from this task force to talk to the license boards in Minnesota uh, to, to get approval ahead of time that they're not going to take away people's licenses if they agree to participate in this program. Um, and the other piece that I wanted, there was two other pieces. One, really recommend that you allow for outdoor use. Um, that's a big thing that we're having of that people are wanting to go out in nature to have these experiences with a facilitator in the woods. Our current rules don't allow for that. Uh, we can have outside space at our service centers, but it has to be within the space of the service center. Um, and then the other piece I really recommend that um, I'm pretty sure Colorado did this and Oregon, we're working on getting it updated, um, is allowing for at-home use for people who are on um, who are at the end of their life or have other mobility issues where they can't actually get to a service center. And so currently we're not allowing for hospice or accessibility um, approaches with psilocybin. And that's a big issue. And ho we're hoping that's going to change soon as well. So those are my main points and I will pass it to the next person. Thank you so much, Emma. All right, we'll move on to Dominique or, or sorry, we'll do Jason and then Dominique. <laughs> Happy to cede the floor to the gentlewoman from Colorado. If she'd like to go first. That's okay, Jason. Okay, cool. Well, thank you all so much for having me, especially thank you to Ari for bringing me on board. I'm really excited to talk with y'all. My name is Jason Ortiz. I currently serve as the Director of Strategic Initiatives for The Last Prisoner Project, and it's a 501c3 organization that helps folks get out of prison that are currently in there for cannabis or psychedelic crimes in places where we now have a legal industry, right? <clears throat> And so as we talk about the regulations of business, we do want to make sure we are reminding everybody that there are criminal justice implications of all of these laws and likely some amount of folks currently incarcerated in your state, in every state, yes, for psychedelics. And if it is the fortunate situation where there's zero, let's announce that. Let's look into the details, find out exactly how many people there are and get that number to zero. That's really what the last prisoner project is here to do. And I've had a lot of experience personally on equity policies, mostly in the cannabis space, as I was the president of the Minority Cannabis Business Association for a couple of years and was able to really develop the equity conversation nationally in that role. And then also had a very significant experience here in Connecticut. I'm from New London, Connecticut, when we had our cannabis legalization fight of actually having to negotiate the details on legislation when it regards to equity. And so the biggest thing that I want to really you know, focus on first and foremost is Decriminalization is a must in any type of conversation about legalization of psychedelics or any drugs. When it comes to access, decriminalization is the best, most effective, most cost efficient way to give access to the people is to allow folks to access it on their own terms in their own homes. And so definitely want to make sure that as we have these conversations, decrim remains central to the conversations, but specifically on equity, we defined equity and I'll say there's no consensus on the specific definition of equity. Despite having done 10 different policy summits with folks across the country, there's lots of different ways people approach it, different groups that they think should be included or not included. For me, the definition of equity is ensuring that the benefits of legalization go to the communities that were most impacted by prohibition. And that word most is gonna become a very interesting word to decipher what that exactly means for your community. But for me, the big questions around equity are, what harm are we trying to repair specifically? One thing that folks kind of get into the trap of is trying to make equity policies solve all of society's problems at one time. And no specific policy, definitely not a drug policy, is able to do that. So we have to figure out exactly who was harmed. And yes, everyone was harmed by prohibition, generally speaking, but there are some communities that were harmed more. Those could be uh, geographic groups that were over-policed. It could be folks that were denied access to life-saving medicines but specifically looking at the people that are most harmed is gonna be a big decision point for y'all as far as what your equity programs will be able to accomplish. 
And then lastly, what are the programs that folks are going to be able to access because they are qualified as an equity applicant or an equity community or however you want to phrase it? Specifically, what are the benefits of these programs? What are they intended to do? What are they intended to provide? And for how long are those programs going to be able to be available? And of course, how do you fund it, right? So for me, and in a lot of our equity spaces, there's three main buckets of equity, criminal justice reform, community investment, and economic opportunity. And so those three buckets are separate issues that all relate back to the war on drugs and how it impacted our communities. It impacted us in the criminal justice sense, it devastated certain communities, and it did deny incredible amounts of economic opportunity to folks. And the reality is that within the drug policy space, there is what is referred to as the legacy market, or what I call the existing community infrastructure that is currently operating economic opportunities in the illicit market. And so how we transition those folks over to the legalized space is going to be a big part of the economic opportunity piece. Now, for criminal justice reform, there's three main facets of that so far release of all the prisoners, right? Really looking at your criminal justice system, who is currently incarcerated, how do they get there, and just making sure that we don't put anybody else back in prison. The biggest point of contention here will be sales. Whether or not possession is decriminalized tends to not be very controversial, but whether or not there is criminal penalties for sale of psychedelics or sale of psilocybin without a license is going to be a huge point of contention. And what is the penalty? Is it just a financial penalty like a fine or is it incarceration? Also, as folks have been released over these crimes, and it's been over you know, 40 years or so, we want to make sure we get expungement right and get all of the records clear so that there's no collateral consequences to those charges and folks are able to work, find a house, et cetera, make sure they can keep control of their kids. Parental rights is definitely something that often gets overlooked that I encourage folks to look at. And then there's also a number of veterans affairs issues that I think are also going to be interesting to decipher exactly how you help veterans specifically. On the community investment front, where the criminal justice is very individualized, community investment is for the whole group, right? For a place, because often a place was over-policed, even with psychedelics. And so that type of investment looks very different and figuring out, are we investing in infrastructure, things like rebuilding sidewalks or rebuilding parks and you know places for children to um, have recreation? Are we creating new local programs that are specifically designed by the folks that are currently in that community about what the specific needs are right now? Or are we doing institution building so that we have a much longer lasting impact by creating entities that can then do this work moving forward, right? A small local project may not last 10 years, but if we're deliberate about creating an office of community investment, that could then last a very long time. And then lastly, on the economic side, ownership and licensing. This is the biggest point of contention all the time. And in the cannabis space, we got it all kinds of wrong. Here in Connecticut, within the equity program, there was an actual license called an equity uh, cultivator license that the licensing fee was $3 million, $3 million on an equity license. And so the idea of economic justice got so perverted and strangely co-opted that it really obliterated any real hope of doing what we intended it to do. There was all kinds of other types of programs called equity joint ventures that would pair an existing operator with an equity operator that creates a really difficult dynamic. I would not recommend doing anything like that because it does create a power dynamic that does not benefit the equity operator, right? And so the last piece of this is definitely going to be how you handle the folks that are the current existing community infrastructure that are unlicensed. If we don't have a real serious way to allow those folks to enter the market, you will have a continued uh, illicit market forever, right? And so in this, I strongly recommend that licensing be unlimited, but strict on safety concerns, right? If you have a limited licensing situation where only a select few people are going to be able to do this, you are guaranteeing that the illicit market is going to continue. And, you know, those folks in those communities have been doing this for a very long time and feeding their families. They're not all of a sudden just gonna stop because legalization happens. So we have to offer them other opportunities that could be within the psychedelic space or just other business opportunities that they may be interested in. So dedicated funding for that particular community is gonna be super important. And on the messaging side, please refrain from using the term, we need to eliminate the black market because the black market is a community of people. And so if you talk about eliminating a community of people, they are not gonna feel welcome to talk to you about how we can work together. So just strongly encourage a reframing on who these dealers are or who is in the illicit market. Really embrace them as folks that are parts of your community because that's what they are and have them enter these conversations and make sure that they're able to say what kind of programs that they actually access, benefit, want, 
And if you're able to do that, I think you'll get a tremendous amount of information about how to solve a lot of problems in society. And of course, I'm here to help with anything that comes up, whether it be on the how to design actual equity language definitions, or also on the criminal justice side, the last prisoner projects, happy to work with your Department of Corrections or Department of Justice to figure out exactly where we're at, and how we can get it down to zero people in prison for psychedelics or cannabis. So thank you so much and happy to answer any questions folks might have. Thank you so much, Jason. All right, we'll move on to Dominique. Um, and then we'll do a QA and a after that. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Um, appreciate the opportunity to be here. I'm Dominique Mendiola, and I serve as the Senior Director for the Colorado Department of Revenue's New Natural Medicine Division, as well as our Marijuana Enforcement Division. And I have had the privilege of um, working in this space for almost uh, 10 years at this point in Colorado. Um, so more material to cover than there's time for, so we'll just jump right into it. Um, starting with how we got here, uh, with a little bit of background before I get into those equity considerations. In Colorado, the introduction of a framework for natural medicine was based on a citizen initiative, so our work is driven by implementing the will of the voters um, of Colorado. In 2002, Colorado voted to pass Proposition 122, the Natural Medicine Health Act. That voter measure and subsequent legislation since then uh, established a personal use personal use and sharing allowances for adults 21 and over. Uh, sharing can be in the context of spiritual guidance or community-based use, for example. It also directed the establishment of a regulatory program for access to natural medicine, which is our focus here today. Um, it divides most of the implement implementation work between two agencies. Um, the law directs our partners at DORA, the Department of Regulatory Agencies, to license and regulate facilitators, those persons approved by the state to administer natural medicine to adults in a regulated environment. The law also creates the new natural medicine division within the Department of Revenue. So that's um, the agency um, I'm speaking on behalf of, and it directs us to license and regulate those facilities. So healing centers, cultivations, manufacturing facilities, and laboratory testing facilities. The proposition and law defined in natural medicine do include psilocybin and psilocin, uh, ibogaine, dimethyltryptamine, so DMT, and mescaline, and that, exp that expressly excludes peyote. Um, the regulatory program has a narrower scope at the start, beginning with psilocybin and psilocin. And as it relates to the regulatory program, the law established an advisory board charged with making recommendations about the standup of the program and where members are appointed by the governor of Colorado. The law had laid out experience that's required for appointment to the board. Examples include um, persons with experience in religious use, issues confronting veterans, and traditional tribal and indigenous use, among other experiences. And to be clear, Colorado's framework does not contemplate a commercial program like we have for cannabis in Colorado. Uh, there won't be dispensaries like you see for cannabis. Rather, the natural medicine program is more therapeutic in nature, uh, where qualified or licensed facilitators will provide services to adults 21 and over in a regulated environment. And as was touched on, this could happen at a healing center or another approved location, like someone's home or a healthcare facility. So when it comes to equity considerations, we're really focusing on how equity can or should be an element of every aspect of our implementation work. And we recognize that this is work that we've engaged in in the cannabis space and a lot of lessons learned um, on that front. And so we take that and make sure that we're also getting a lot of diverse um, stakeholder input to make sure that we are accountable to that and considering that in each of our conversations with stakeholders. So first, this was touched on considering how our agency is resourced or funded. Um, this includes things like staffing and program needs. For example, we're set up as a cash funded agency and that means that we are expected to be sustainable from application and license fees. Um, recognizing the barriers to entry that this can pose for some, we are taking a very incremental approach to resourcing our agency. While we work to develop the rules and we're front-loading our agency with resources before we even have rules in place, isn't we want to make sure that that's not driving uh, what our fees look like. So many of us are splitting our time between our cannabis regulatory program and this new natural medicine program. So for example, my salary is split between two separate cash funds based on the work that I'm engaging in for these two programs. Also, as it relates to our rulemaking work, um, in our rulemaking that is currently underway, we're learning about concerns around things like security requirements. So how does this impact the work of folks who provide other services like therapy entirely separate from natural medicine services, but who want to integrate an element of this into their work? 
um, where, for example, surveillance for an entire room uh, compared to just a portion of a room where natural medicine is stored or the types of considerations we want to keep in mind. And uh, of course, thinking about those ultimate costs of, of complying with requirements. We've also done a survey to understand the range of environments people want to create for healing centers, um, including, and this was touched on, indoor and outdoor settings, as well as individual and group sessions. Um, cultivation license expectations and interaction with healing center licensees has also come up. So we're considering things like, do we need a micro cultivation license type um, at a much lower cost than say a, a other cultivation tiers for someone who wants to operate um, a very, or, or cultivate a very small amount for their own practice compared to a cultivation uh, operation who wants to focus on uh, contract, uh, contracting with various healing centers to supply them with natural medicine. Um, we've also held uh, listening sessions, other public engagements, including a focus on first responders and members of federally recognized tribes and indigenous uh, community members. And just as it relates to first responders, the work of first responders who may encounter scenarios that involve someone who consume natural medicine and that may require medical or other intervention. And so just wanna highlight briefly some of the um, takeaways from that session and uh, that I thought was really valuable to our work. And so as it relates to curriculum or educational resource considerations, there are discussions around terminology. Um, my colleague Jason had uh, touched on this as, you know, words matter and how, how are we uh, referencing certain terms? So terminology incorporated into training materials, how are we thinking about that, including what to avoid. Um, examples of misuse or abuse or diversion. Um, that's just what we hear is important to effective education um, and interactions, as well as awareness of cultural practices for first responders to have that awareness. Uh, behavioral health response. So initiatives focused on reducing arrests and hospitalizations um, or involuntary commitments unarmed response opportunities. So thinking about the value of unarmed or plain clothes officers, um, law enforcement response coupled with unarmed services. So mental health professionals, for example, and questions dispatchers should be asking when responding to calls related to natural medicine. Um, also, or how we would look to distinguish responses at a private residence compared to a healing center. So those are some things we're looking at. Uh, we're also considering uh, priority application review considerations. Initial focus has been on, and those these discussions are continuing on identifying one or more owners who have a traditional tribal or indigenous history with natural medicine, um, identifying owners who are veterans and other, other measures or um, best practices that may inform that priority application review. Um, just, I will pause there, recognizing that we're looking for time for Q&A and other dialogue. So uh, appreciate again, this opportunity. Thank you so much, Dominique. All right, so we have about 10 minutes for a Q&A. Um, on the mural exercise for the members, there are, you know, sort of a couple prompts in terms of like what we're thinking in terms of cost to implement, equity access and justice considerations, drug supply, data collection, liability concerns, what other states are using these models. Uh, eligibility screening for clients, um, consulting with tribal nations, veterans, patients, marginalized populations, public health and law enforcement, and public education and, and state agencies that could help um, piggyback on some of the, this, this work that we're doing that already exists and have infrastructure. So I'll open it up if folks want to raise their hand um, to ask our guest speakers any questions. And thank you so much for joining. Yes, Frenji. I just want to first thank the guests for joining us today. Um, and I had a question, both maybe Dominique and Emma could uh, respond to this. Uh, Emma, you had mentioned that uh, currently in Oregon, uh, people, I'm a physician, I'm a psychiatrist, I work in the space, I use ketamine to sort of occasion non-ordinary states of consciousness. And um, a lot of our therapists are worried, well, if this was uh, brought on, can you sort of sit and facilitate taking off your licensure hat, for for example, that's okay as a facilitator. Is that right? Like you, you, you can have your license, but once you enter the room, the patient, I'm assuming self-administers the medicine and then the therapist or sorry, the facilitator takes off their therapist hat, facilitates the session. And then afterwards, 
Emma, according to you um, in Oregon, the integration component cannot be done under the, the hat of a therapist. Is that correct? And Colorado has sort of shifted that. Yeah, that's correct. So through the entire arc of services, preparation, administration, integration, our therapist hats have to be off. And many of us are still concerned that our licenses are in jeopardy because we're working with a Schedule One substance at all, even if it's not under our license still. Yeah. Okay. That's really important. We really need to work with our, you know, medical boards and licensing board to, to... okay. Thank you. I really appreciate this. Yeah, Bennett. Well, thanks everybody. Um, this is a, a, I think, a general question for everyone who just presented. Um, it's it's a question about um, improving access and and uh, lowering cost. And I think one of the major um, barriers to lowering cost will be obviously the Section Two Eighty E issue. Um, if, if businesses that are are facilitating um, and and say they're facilitating psilocybin and it's still a Schedule One controlled substance, not being able to write off those business expenses is going to increase the the cost to the patient by you know I, I don't know what it works out to be, but probably something like twenty or thirty percent compared to what it would be if people uh, if these businesses were able to write off their expenses. So my question is other than generally lowering the, the state and regulatory imposed costs, like licensing fees or a facility requirement, are there any other ways that your states or that you have seen um, states be able to lower the impact of Section 280E and, and not being able to write off business expenses? I can answer this one, if that's helpful. I can just tell you what we do, and there's a lot of other service centers doing this as well. Um, and there was that we have had people on stage suggest that we do this. So it's it's a little bit of work around, but it's also has been approved by the attorneys um, of that many people have multiple business structures. So you have a business entity that is the trafficking entity that is being that is applied with 280, and then you have another business structure where you run the payments for other things through. And so you have both of them functioning under the same roof. One of them 280E applies to, one of them it doesn't. Mason, I'm guessing you have some thoughts too. Yeah, I think what you find is people doing these kinds of contortions that they think will get them out of this liability. And it's very debatable whether that's even possible. And um you know, I, I and many other people have come to believe that these heavily regulated and supervised programs, it's just impossible to make them affordable or equitable. So my answer would be just don't do it. And also, I think it's quite revealing um, what Emma said about the state's uh, licensing boards and their concerns and the risk there. That's quite revealing. Uh, as I've mentioned before, the states that do commingle conventional healthcare with these substances are taking huge risks and they'll be the ones that draw the most attention from federal authorities. Thanks. Um, and of course, it, you know, this is not an issue for a substance that's schedule three or lower. So if MDMA does indeed get rescheduled later this year, or is at least recommended for rescheduling, then that shouldn't be an issue. Um, psilocybin I know is, is, but you know, some somewhat further down the path of of consideration for rescheduling. Um, so who knows what that looks like? But it's it's just something I, I want to think about as we're as we're at the report phase. So thank thank you all. I do want to just highlight that there is the Safe Banking Act that is being discussed in Congress, right? That is generally applied to the cannabis industry, but it is very possible it could pass this year. And so any work on that and make sure it includes the psychedelic space, I think would solve this a lot. But I think, you know, 280E only really applies like once you're in business and you're actually generating revenue for access and cost purposes. The more amount of people that are able to open up a space will generally be able to reduce the cost because there is a bigger market, there's a bigger space for folks. And so the state can always provide business startup resources, direct funding, grants, similar to how the Small Business Administration does it for other businesses to help the startup cost be a lot less.
And so I do think if that's a big concern, remember the state can fund programs directly saying the state was the one that created this negative situation. And so we're gonna put in investments to help it happen. And that is how a lot of cannabis equity operators were able to access significant money to buy equipment, all the different you know pieces to get up off the ground. So definitely look to your small business administrations of how they support regular businesses and see if you can just port those over and fund those in this particular space. Thanks, Jason. All right, Paula? Uh, just two quick questions. Uh, Jason, if you could briefly indicate why decrim is a better option than legalization and Dominique, if you could speak to how the personal use and sharing uh, program is going for adults 21 and over restricted to the, the psilocybin only uh, in terms of public health considerations, public safety issues. I'll take the decrim one first. And so it is not opposed to legalization. It is a mandatory part of legalization, right? And so when we say decrim versus regulated access, I see them as complementary, right? And then it does get a little bit frustrating sometimes on the community organizing space where folks see them as oppositional, but I think they support each other, right? Decrim allows for access immediately and in a way that the community can decide exactly how it's gonna play out for them in the privacy of their own home as an American citizen, right? That being said, not everybody is gonna have access to a community and that's where you do need regulated access, especially for folks like senior citizens or other folks that maybe aren't gonna go out to a space and go you know, buy psilocybin from you know, somebody that's far away. Regulated access also allows for things like delivery for folks that are physically enabled to leave their houses. And also the regulated space is going to take years and years to get off the ground and may not, right? Like we're seeing all kinds of spaces where the access to the legal space is reducing, right? Businesses are closing. Where decriminalization, once it's done, it's going to be a way for folks to engage with this forever. And it does allow the community to say, how are we going to educate each other? How are we going to handle regulation on a community sense, right? If there is a bad actor in our community, what are we doing outside of the legal system? And what decriminalization does is allows those conversations to begin to say, it's okay to talk about this. <laughs> you know, we're gonna be supported by the different spaces. Your school systems will have to start talking about it. And it really is moving beyond using criminal justice as a punitive approach to drug regulation in society. And I think that psychological and ideological shift is going to help all of these problems tremendously. And in a financial sense, being able to grow your own, making sure you're doing it however you make sense is just dramatically cheaper, like a hundredfold cheaper. And so once folks are able to engage with it on that space, they're more likely to reach out to a regulated provider and say, hey, you know, I tried it at home. I kind of need a little bit more help as I'm doing this. And the stigma around the substance disappears over time. And the biggest thing though is really the regulated systems just take forever to come online and become so cost prohibitive that you still have folks doing it the old way anyway. So you need both of those to happen at the same time with some community investment to really get folks to shift over to trusting the regulated space. Thank hey, you, Jason. Uh, All right. Um, we'll have you respond and then we're we're gonna basically be out of time. So we'll we'll have you say your piece and then we'll we'll move on. Thank you. Thank you. I'll just uh, address the question. So when it comes to the personal use provisions in Colorado, it uh, the personal use provisions uh, in effect uh, hit on all uh, allow for sharing uh, personal possession um, and sharing for uh, between adults. And it applies to all of those natural medicines that I had listed earlier, not just limited to psilocybin and psilocin. Um, it allows for personal cultivation in a space that can't cannot exceed 12 by 12 feet. That doesn't have to be contiguous. Um, and the sharing with adults, it can be in the context of counseling, spiritual guidance, community-based use, uh, supported use or related services. Um, there's no remuneration um, and so no sales transactions uh, in these personal use sharing um, provisions, except um, as it relates to services like bona fide harm reduction or support services used concurrently with sharing. Um, now, there's no advertising allowed um, related to sharing or services. And if somebody is engaging and sharing in the personal use space, they have to inform that they're not a licensed facilitator. Um, there are some other um, provisions related to that, but we this is where we have seen the value in our um, engaging proactively with uh, members of law enforcement. Um, and, and that's around creating awareness about the changes in the law to support any needs for uh, training or educational materials or other support. And uh, this is an important element of the work that we're engaging in um, where uh, we want to make sure that uh, that we are proactive in mitigating instances of inappropriate enforcement or other disrupt 
disruption of uh, personal regulated activities that are now expressly allowed under state law. We have seen some activity where people are engaging in advertising of uh, psilocybin. So we, because we're, we want to support the transition of people understanding these changes in the law rather than just lead with enforcement, we're engaging in things like notice uh, to cease and desist uh, and creating other education materials just for the public to wrap their arms around this, as well as our law enforcement and other partners. Thanks, Dominique. All right. So we're we're over time. I do want to allow Mason to say um, something. It looks like you have your hand raised and then briefly, Jason, and then we'll need to take a break. Yeah, I just wanted to I believe ibogaine sharing is not allowed, correct? That was recriminalized in Colorado, right? That that was a, yeah, a change from the subsequent law, then a narrow scope. Thank you. And the advertising, um, the, the the prohibition on advertising harm reduction services, that was also implemented through the same law, the uh, SB 23290. And I think I just want to point out that that's a concern because it means that people can't promote harm reduction and it kind of, so that can be counterproductive. So something to consider when you're thinking about equity and, and harm reduction. Thank you. All right, were there any other closing pieces that folks want to share before we take our break or final questions? Um, so for members, um, just over the next week, um, if you could add any of your thoughts to the mural table that we've put on there around these different topics. And, you know, if you work for a state agency, how do you think this works within your agency or your community? Please um, use the sticky notes that are um, next to the table to provide your feedback. Um, I do want to thank our, our guest speakers, Mason Marks, Jason Ortiz, Dominique Mendiola, and Emma Knighton for joining us and sharing their perspectives on how things are going in Colorado, Oregon, and nationally. We're really grateful for all the work that you're doing. The landscape is constantly evolving, and, and we're just trying to keep up. So thank you so much for sharing everything with us. Um, and thank you, everyone, for um, questions and engaging conversations. We're going to take a 10-minute break. Uh, so we'll come back at 11 a.m. Central Standard Time, um, where we'll go and we'll talk. Uh, we'll hear from Caroline about the research episode updates from the psilocybin clinical trials, and then we will do our working group update to talk about um, whether we want to do a regulated program with magic mushrooms in Minnesota. All right, so thank you, everyone, and we'll see you back here in 10 minutes at 11 a.m. Thank you for our speakers. See you. For those of you within the sound of my voice, we're coming back in about a minute and a half here. All right, it's 11 a.m., everyone, uh, and it is time for Caroline uh, to give us her psilocybin literature review. Caroline, whenever you're ready. Excellent. Thank you, Jess. Um, so today we're talking about the psilocybin literature review. Like last month, um, I sent out a document with some of the details of that review. And so today, again, we'll be focused a little more high level. Um, I also want to make sure everyone's on the same page. I'll just be talking about psilocybin as tested in these peer-reviewed randomized control trials um, or RCTs. And something else to keep in mind is that these trials used a synthetic form of psilocybin as opposed to the whole natural mushroom. Um, so we can move to the next slide. Excellent. So here's a quick overview of um, what we'll discuss today. Again, I will remind everyone of the health conditions we identified initially. Um, we'll dive into the research really surrounding psilocybin as a treatment for mood and anxiety disorders. We'll talk about some of the clinical risks, um, and then we'll do another um, you know, mur mural activity and discussion. Next slide, please. So to review, our initial search identified the following conditions as potentially treatable with psilocybin. Um, like last time, I've struck out those conditions that didn't have RCTs supporting the data. And a few kind of quick disclaimers, while a study with data supporting the use of psilocybin as a treatment for alcohol use disorder was analyzed, given the number of trials found for mood and anxiety disorders, uh, we won't have time to discuss this as a group today. Um, and additionally, there was a study that investigated psilocybin as a treatment for cluster headache, um, but this overall didn't find that it was particularly efficacious. And so we won't talk about that as a group either. 
But the details for each of those um, are in that document, and I certainly encourage you to read through it if you haven't already. Um, so the main thing that we will discuss today with our limited time is the use of psilocybin in the treatment of mood disorders, which included major depressive disorder, treatment-resistant depression, and bipolar type 2 disorder, and anxiety disorders, uh, which included any diagnosed anxiety disorder, but mainly this ended up being generalized anxiety disorder. Uh, so next slide, please. So overall, a total of nine studies met our criteria, um, and these were all phase two clinical trials. So just quickly, um, mood and anxiety disorders are grouped together because not only were they measured together in these studies, um, they're often co-occurring. And so all of these trials included a therapy component, both um, before the start of the trial and after each administration of psilocybin. During the administration, the participants were asked to direct their attention inward and weren't subjected to any you know, kind of structured psychotherapy. Um, the drug was typically given in either one or two facilitated sessions, um, although one trial allowed participants to receive up to three sessions. Participants were scored for their baseline levels of depression and anxiety, and changes in these scores were compared um, at the end of the trial both between the drug and the control conditions um, and within each group from baseline to finish. The doses of psilocybin ranged from one to three milligrams as an active control. Um, and this takes place of a placebo up to 10 to 30 milligrams as the experimental dose. Um, so in total, these nine trials included almost 600 participants with major depressive disorder, treatment resistant depression, bipolar type two uh, and or anxiety disorders. And additionally, some of these studies address psilocybin as a treatment for depression or anxiety with those uh, with a life-threatening illness. The experimental endpoints uh, ranged from two to 12 weeks uh, with a follow-up up to six months after the last treatment session. So nearly 520 of these individuals received any dose of the drug um, and that's because it's really difficult to design psychedelic drug experiments with a true placebo condition, um, because like Paula had mentioned at the top, uh, people tend to be able to figure out if they have gotten this drug or not. Um, and so some of these studies will give a control group a very low dose of the drug, one that may have slight psychoactive effects, but presumably won't have therapeutic effects um, in place of a true placebo. Other studies may stagger the treatment and compare the scores of those who have received the drug um, versus those who haven't gotten it yet. This is called a waitlist control, or they will run one placebo and one psilocybin group through the whole experiment at the same time, and then they switch the groups and run it again. Um, and this is a crossover trial. And so these types of studies allow for the immediate comparisons of drug versus no drug um, but because all individuals eventually get psilocybin, um, the long-term effects and durability of the treatment are sometimes difficult to parse out. Um, but that being said, two of these trials did in fact have just one psilocybin and one complete placebo group. And so overall, 370 of these nearly 600 participants received at least one session with the full experimental dosage and the associated integrative sessions. Um, and so from here on, I'll just be calling this the psilocybin group. And so ultimately, all of these studies found that psilocybin-assisted therapy had a significant beneficial effect on measures of both depression and anxiety, both when compared with their respective control condition and when looking between the beginning and ending scores just in those psilocybin groups. In fact, uh, some of these studies, uh, the significant reductions in depression scores particularly, happened as soon as the very next day after treatment, after the first treatment. Um, and so these improvements were also often sustained throughout the whole rest of the trial. Uh, these positive effects of psilocybin also extended to measures of response to the drug, which is defined as a reduction of 50% or more in their symptoms and in remission um, which indicates no longer meeting the criteria for a diagnosis. That is, 
both a clinical response to the drug and remission from the disorder um, occurred more often in those who received psilocybin. Next slide, please. So there were a few meta-analyses um, that investigated these studies. As a quick reminder, a meta-analysis is the statistical combination of the results of multiple studies um, and is the appropriate way to compare the efficacy of different treatments. One output from this is an effect size. Um, effect sizes are statistical measures of the magnitude of difference between two populations. So the scale of how to interpret some of these numbers is in that overview document, but essentially, the further from zero, the larger the effect. So four meta-analyses have been conducted encompassing these trials. And when comparing directly between those full experimental doses of psilocybin and the control groups, each of them found that psilocybin produced a statistically large beneficial effect on depression and anxiety as compared with the control groups. So that is, um, these analyses found that the symptoms were significantly reduced in those individuals that received the experimental doses of psilocybin as compared with those who didn't. Similarly, when looking just at those who received the full doses of psilocybin and comparing their scores before treatment to their scores after treatment, again, there were very large beneficial effects of psilocybin on both depression and anxiety. One of these meta-analyses also calculated both the response and the remission rates in both psilocybin and control groups across these RCTs. Um, and they found that overall, 57% of participants who received psilocybin showed a response to it, again, meaning that their symptoms decreased by 50% or more, as compared with only 22% um, of the control individuals. Furthermore, this meta-analysis found that 45% of the people who received psilocybin were considered to have reached remission, again, meaning that they no longer met the criteria for a diagnosis, as compared with only 14% of the control individuals. And so the big takeaway from these studies is that overall, in a clinical setting at least, psilocybin-assisted therapy appears to show efficacy in alleviating symptoms of both depression and anxiety. Um, next slide, please. So our big task is to compare this efficacy against current standard treatments. And in fact, one of these studies did just that. Um, so they directly compared psilocybin and the SSRI antidepressant escitalopram, um, one brand name you might know is Lexapro, both in conjunction with therapy on depression. So nearly 60 participants were divided into two groups, psilocybin or escitalopram. Both groups received two sessions with a facilitator. During this time, the psilocybin group received 25 milligrams of psilocybin. And to try to control for the effects of the drug, the SSRI group also got psilocybin, um, but at an active control dose of one milligram. Following the session, those in the SSRI group got their escitalopram pills to take daily until the next session, while those in the psilocybin group got placebo pills. Both groups also got two follow-up psychotherapy integration sessions. Three weeks after the drug session, everyone came back to do it all again. Psilocybin group got another 25 milligrams of the drug and the SSRI group got another one milligram. Again, you know, each group was given their escitalopram or their placebo pills to take for another three weeks, along with two more psychotherapy integration visits. At the end of the study, which was six weeks after the baseline, the researchers found um, that both groups saw a decrease in their depression scores and that there was no difference between the two groups. So this indicates, um, this indicates that in this trial, two instances of psilocybin-assisted therapy produced an equal response to daily standard antidepressant use in conjunction with therapy after six weeks. The researchers also measured response and remission. Here they found that 70% of the participants in the psilocybin group responded to the treatment, while only 48% of the people in the SSRI group did. 
Similarly, remission was found to occur in 57% of the individuals in the psilocybin group, as opposed to only 28% of those who received the SSRI. A caveat to this particular study, however, is that there was no placebo group that didn't receive any intervention at all. Um, next slide, please. So while that study took on a direct comparison, there have been no meta-analyses that have done the same. Like last month though, we can kind of start to talk about the imperfect comparisons of these psilocybin meta-analyses versus the um, output of meta-analyses on standard treatments. So the current standard treatments for mood and anxiety disorders are antidepressants, anti-anxiety medications, and or psychotherapy, um, like cognitive behavioral therapy or CBT. So one meta-analysis investigated 21 different antidepressants uh, without a therapeutic component and found overall when compared to a placebo, all of these medications showed significant efficacy, but resulting in a medium to low effect size. Um, so I'm not showing the numbers here because all of these analyses used a statistic called the odds ratio, which gives different raw numbers than, than what we've been talking about previously, um, but we can still kind of talk qualitatively about effect sizes. Um, and so the full information, all these numbers is in that overview document. Um, but Another meta-analysis that uh, investigated psychotherapy in conjunction with antidepressants as compared with placebo found a medium effect size. Uh, and finally, a meta-analysis investigating psychotherapy only found a low effect size of treatment. Um, so on the right is that same information from a few slides ago, um, the results of the meta-analysis of the, or the meta-analyses of the psilocybin RCTs just as non-numerical comparisons. Um, again, the numbers are all in that document. But as you can see, psilocybin-assisted therapy returned large to very large effect sizes as compared with low to medium effect sizes for the standard treatments. Um, however, you know, do remember that these are not direct comparisons just yet. Uh, okay, so let's move on to the next slide. Thank you. So in the clinical trials, um, the reported adverse effects were mild to moderate and the frequency and intensity of these effects was dose dependent. That is, they increased as dosage increased. Most reported effects were headache, nausea, dizziness, and fatigue, um, but all were considered tolerable. Headaches sometimes persisted a day or so after treatment, uh, which was true in studies in, you know, quote unquote, healthy individuals as well. Although uncommon, some more serious side effects um, that could occur during treatment included migraine and paranoia. However, these were rare um, and are not statistically likely in response to a single therapeutic dose. Apart from these short-term effects, you know, some other post-treatment concerns include patient destabilization and post-session adaptation difficulties. Uh, but something worth noting about some of these negative short-term effects um, is in the, the study that directly compared psilocybin with the SSRI, the percent of people who experienced uh, certain negative effects like anxiety or reduced emotional responsiveness were actually all higher in the SSRI group. Um, physiologically, psilocybin was found to increase both blood pressure and heart rate but this was during treatment only and it required no intervention. So all measurements returned to baseline after the drug effects wore off. Um, an open label trial, so that means that participants knew what they were getting, uh, but this trial, there was a trial that included individuals who received psilocybin treatment while still on SSRIs. Um, and they didn't find any additional negative side effect of taking the two drugs at the same time outside of those already mentioned. But because psilocybin interacts with the serotonergic system, there will be some considerations in terms of drug-drug interactions and use in individuals with certain cardiovascular conditions. Um, quickly, I wanna mention that you know, the literature suggests that even though psilocybin is in schedule one, there is a low potential for abuse and a low potential for toxicity. 
Like we discussed with LSD, many of the negative side effects um, that have been reported occur in use outside of the clinic, uh, particularly in those who are young or inexperienced and or are in a bad mindset or physical location. Um, and so we don't really have time to talk about it here because I wanna make sure we can really get into a discussion about this, uh, but the side effects of current treatments are in that document as well for you kind of to do a comparison on your own. Um, so we can move on to the last slide. Thank you. Uh, so uh, like last time, we can move into this mural activity slash discussion portion. Um, it's set up like last month, but I'll walk you through it again briefly. Um, so oh, thank you for zooming out. Perfect. So we start at the top here, um, you know, with kind of that basic overview, fundamental question of, do we even want to recommend psilocybin? Um, so the green dots around the edges, you can use to vote yes or no. Um, and then from there, you can also use these green dots to kind of place in the route that you think that this should take. Um, there's the white comment boxes around that you can move in to make any specific comments you want to make. Um, but I think now is a great time for us to open it up for discussion. Thank you so much, Caroline. That was a really great overview and your report was very comprehensive. I enjoyed reading it. Thank you for putting that together. Thank you. Um, so so do, does anyone have any questions for Caroline to discuss? Just go ahead and raise your hand and we'll get a cue going. I think one thought I had, Caroline, was around some of the... I noticed in the report, we were talking about like no RCTs for obsessive compulsive disorder and things like that. Um, and are you referencing just what's found in the literature versus what's actually like ongoing? Because I know there is a tobacco uh, multi-center trial. There's also an OCD trial. They just haven't published the results yet. So I just want folks to keep that in mind when we're talking about like what's actually out there, what's happening versus what we're putting into our report in terms of published literature only. Yeah, thank you for bringing that up. Um, so based on the task force vote in January, we voted, everyone voted for RCTs that have been peer reviewed in published literature. Um, so again, that's a very restrictive kind of condition. So we're not looking at things that haven't been peer reviewed and published yet. We're not looking at results of clinical trials that you know are kind of outside of that very strict um, definition. So again, you know, there are things that are still happening. I think there's like seven or so currently registered phase three trials um, for psilocybin in mood disorders. We haven't looked at those yet, just the basic criteria here. Thanks. All right, Adam and then Renji. Thank you. Uh, I don't have a question for Caroline. Would this be an opportunity to, to discuss Jessica's or just more questions for Caroline? Whatever you prefer. I mean, we have just time to discuss for away. Um, and then for both medical and non medical, uh, just as a reminder, you know, I'm here appointed by Governor Walls to represent patients with treatment resistant mental health conditions. <clears throat> so we are people for whom conventional existing treatments do not work. And our state's in a crisis. I'm doing my very best to represent and to advocate for people who are hurting, uh, for people who are struggling with suicide, who are poisoning themselves with alcohol, who are overdosing on opiates, and existing medical options have failed those people. And I'm not, you know, I also have Kit and Michael and Stefan who represent other patients or veterans with the similar uh, conditions. I, we're hearing from Caroline and both the report that we received, the 17 page report, as well as the presentation, that these are clinically demonstrated to help people with depression and anxiety. They are effective. And just as important, these substances, mushrooms, are uh, non lethal. They are low potential for abuse, low potential for toxicity. And additionally, they've been used for thousands of years. We're very much looking at this right now within the realm of like Western 
medical science. But the truth is that people have been using psilocybin containing mushrooms for tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of years, long before Western civilization even. Um, we heard some really good stuff from Dominique Mendiola from Colorado about using psilocybin containing mushrooms for spiritual guidance, for community use, for supported use. We've also heard from our native members about the possibility of using mushrooms in a traditional native ceremony or a traditional guided ceremony or an aid for meditation. And I, I really would encourage everybody to think broadly about healing rather than narrowly about Western medical science, because these are ancient molecules that have been used for, for generations to help people. And, you know, professionally, I'm a prosecutor. I spent 12 years handling domestic violence, sexual assault, robberies, homicides, like things that you would only see in hell, just horrible, horrible things. And I don't think anybody can seriously question my commitment to public safety or my commitment to law and order, but I recognize our paradigm needs to change. So bottom line, there's a lot of Minnesotans who are hurting. We're hurting really badly and we're feeling hopeless and the science shows that mushrooms can help. So for those reasons, I'm voting yes, and I would encourage you to vote yes as well. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. Renji, and then Bennett. Thank you, Adam, for those comments. I'm voting yes, of course. Uh, first of all, I think that there's a signal to the noise with respect to the science. I think the there's clear evidence that these molecules do work and they're fairly effective. Uh, to Caroline, I, but I'm also appointed by uh, Governor Walls as a physician uh, treating patients with TRD. And part of my role is to look at the science, sort of, you know, communicate things back uh, from the ground, the things that I see when I'm treating patients. And as I look at these articles, I want people to remember, and not only our group, but the people that are listening in, that patients are screened for these particular studies. They may have inclusion criteria or exclusion criteria that prevent them from, you know, proceeding with some of their, um, yeah, protocols. And so there's some sort of a screening and safety assessment that occurs prior to them sort of proceeding with these um, particular research articles. And maybe that's why we see, a, you know, uh, this the, the signal. But I still believe that there's a signal, meaning that there's a positive effect and a large effect, as you can uh, see. So I just want to point out or, or just mention that that as we look at these articles, let's look at the, these articles through the lens of patients being appropriately screened. And that's my only comment is I, I want to make sure that as we proceed with this, um, as we proceed with this, that that the ultimate, um, the patient safety comes first. That's it. Uh, and whatever that means, whether you know facilitators are trained in learning how to screen patients, if we do proceed down the line of facilitators, what does that education look like? Um, the patient always has to come first and I'll just leave it at that. Thanks, Renji. I think that's an important point. <laughs> to bring up. Um, I do also kind of want to point out, and then I'll get to you, Bennett, around, you know, there is the option. I'm voting for all options because I think we also do need research for that exact reason, that there are a handful of uh, clinical populations that are explicitly excluded from these trials for reasons that are somewhat anecdotal um, and, and a fear of having serious adverse events in a clinical trial to push through, you know, to a, a, a successful phase three. Um, clinical trial, and that we don't actually have that safety data for certain populations. That's not to say that they can't benefit from it. We just don't know. Um, so the exclusion of those people is not because it is inherently dangerous. It's because we really don't know what the safety profile is. So I think we should keep that in mind. Um, all right, Bennett. Thank you. Um, the one thing I want to be sure we keep front of mind, and I, I've mentioned this before, um, is what the legislature wants and what the legislators in our group um, see as the path forward for any bills that come out of this report. 
So um, what I want is a bill or what I want is, is a report that follows the science that fulfills the, the um, charge we've been given by the legislature. But I also want to report that the legislators are actually going to use. Um, and so I think there, I, I don't have any, um, any action items right now. I know legislature is still in session and, and I'm working with a, a number of legislators right now and they're like all on the floor voting until like 1 30 in the morning every day. So um, that I think probably by next month, hopefully the, the legislators in this group will be able to dedicate uh, several hours um, in a block to the, the task force. Um, but I, I want to be sure that we're talking to them about this question because they are the ones who are going to know the temperatures in each of their caucuses, um, in each of their legislative bodies. And we'll know, like, if we turn in a report that says X um, or recommends X, they'll they'll hopefully have a, a good sense of like, will the legislature actually consider this? Will they just chuck pieces of it out? Which, you know, I've worked on on a task force in a report before where the legislature asked us to write a report and we brought it to them, giving them exactly what they wanted. And they threw away like three quarters of it before they even started writing the bill, just because they said, yeah, we just don't have the capacity for most of this. Um, so I, I want to be sure that we are considering what the legislature actually could, could and, and will act on. And so I think as we're making this decision, it will be really, really important to hear from all of the legislators before we lock anything in that that's that's my piece so thank you thank you bennett that's an important thing to keep in mind um all right we'll go with dave and then uh, adam again uh, hi this is dave and i just have a clarification question for caroline um in the report where you discuss the risk um do you notice, um, you know, like the duration of evaluation for these risks in these trials? Um, I, I don't have a sense of how 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 long these these um, patients are monitored for for risk. Um, a lot of a lot of the risk comes or mo is monitored directly in those sessions. So they monitor them for things like their changes in blood pressure, their changes in heart rate anything that they might volunteer themselves. You know, I have a headache, I feel anxious. Um, they also monitor them during the whole of the experimental study. So some, some studies were as short as two weeks, some were as long as 12 weeks. Some had follow-ups, you know, six months after the last, um, you know, date of the time they got the drug. And so they're, they're being monitored during the experimental session. Once that ends though, you know, long-term, they don't have that kind of data. Okay, thank you very much. That, that's very helpful, thank you. You're welcome. Adam, you wanna go next? Sure, I'll just respond respectfully to, respectfully to Bennett. Uh, I disagree. Uh, our task force duty is to fully and honestly report to the legislature. We are not writing legislation. I do not believe our task force should censor ourselves or create artificial limits based on what we think might be politically feasible. I am interested to hear from the elected officials who are sitting on the task force, but ultimately the political pragma pragmatic political reality is a different question than what we're doing. That is up to the legislature. You know, our duty is to provide an honest report and the politicians will do what the politicians do. I don't think we should censor ourselves or limit ourselves. Thank you. Thanks, Adam. Yeah, and I think, you know, I appreciate everyone's voices on this and making sure that we are first and foremost answering the legislative charge and doing the things outlined in the legislation, which I do believe we are in fact doing. We're carefully and comprehensively researching all of the therapeutic indications in the randomized controlled clinical trials. Um, we have yet to sort of explore the broader context of like survey-based research and the gray literature, but if you refer back to our charter and our kind of guiding principles, that is kind of listed as one of the things we should be factoring in, which might bear out more as we start looking into recommendations. Um, and we're looking at all the legal consequences of what does this look like to keep us out of the federal crosshairs um, and, and what statutory changes we need to do to implement anyth anything that we um, 
decide to recommend to the legislature, but yes, ultimately <laughs> they're going to decide what they're going to do. And hopefully we can just give them as much of the information that they can so they can make an informed decision on which pathway they feel would be best to pass in a bill um, in all or <laughs> none form that we send to them. Um, I do want to be mindful of time, so I'll get to you, Kit, and then we need to move on, which is going to extend the conversation just around the working group updates and kind of continuing the conversation around how we want to regulate psilocybin and magic mushrooms. Kit, do you want to go ahead and come on camera? Um, my question is, I know that there's been some back and forth as to whether Nicole Mitchell is going to be called to resign off of a Senate seat. And that may make a difference as to whether or not we present our, well, our report would have a good chance of resulting in any sort of progress this year if we no longer have a democratic majority. Um, does anyone know if she's gonna be called to resign or anything? I can, I can speak to that a little bit. Um, I think it's highly unlikely she resigns before the end of session. Um, all of the omnibus bills haven't been passed yet. So these are like the big, you know, 200 page catch all bills for like everything having to do with commerce, everything having to do with health. Um, those are all those packages are being put together right now. And a lot of them will probably be voted on in the next week or two. Um, and then will continue to be voted on over the next month until session's over. So I think it's really, really unlikely that she resigns before then. Um, she's been uh, removed from her position on um, her committees, but that really, that that doesn't really mean very much. Um, I think, I mean, politically, who knows, like maybe she decides to, st you know, resign over the summer or something like that. And they hold a special election before next session. But I mean, ultimately, I also think it's important to remember that this um, issue of psychedelic medicine and access is not uh, really that partisan of an issue. That's that's the other thing to remember um, is that there are there are proponents and opponents in both parties in in the at the state legislature. So that's good to know. That, Thank those, you. Those are my thoughts on it. Thanks. We're going to move on to Ari, and then we'll um, move on after that to the working group updates. Ari? Thanks, Jessica. Um, and thanks, Kit. And I think just to add that any um, legislation that comes from our report wouldn't come until the next session anyway. And we have an election year between now and then anyway. So I think it's all kind of up in the air. Yeah, good point. All right, Caroline, is there anything else you want to kind of close out with this section of the the meeting? No, not not in particular. Um, if anyone has any specific questions that come up, please feel free to email me. I'm happy to answer any of them. Awesome. Thank you so much, Caroline. That was great. Very comprehensive. Really appreciate all the work you're doing. Um, okay, so next we're going to move on to the working group update. So this will be kind of the remainder of our meeting today. We will take a brief 10 minute break. Um, probably closer to noon uh, to give folks a chance to take another breather, bio break. Um, so first we'll go over the legal update that Paula will present, and then we'll follow that with the regulatory working group update by Adam. So Paula, take it away. Great, thank you. I did uh, have the kind of the summary of my, my presentation sent out. So I think you have that there if you wanna reference it, but uh, I'm gonna speak quickly and just go through it and then we can certainly discuss. Uh, so the legal work group uh, has, made a decision that they are supporting um, the uh, legalization or decrim, I guess, frankly, that has not been clarified. There has not been a, an in-depth discussion about whether we're talking about legalization or decriminalization, but uh, the, the recommendation is, is that um, people have access to naturally grown um, magic mushrooms, psilocybin, again, organically, not synthetic, uh, for adult regulated use. Um, again, just uh, really emphasizing that there's lots of uh, documented benefits and we're not talking about uh, just in a medical setting, but um, uh, access for adults. And um, uh, really kind of looking at some of the, the concerns that have been uh, addressed through the process, uh, through our, our, our uh, experts and um, really kind of taking a, a close look at, at what the legal considerations are. I highlighted some of these. I, I just want to emphasize, I think that we really are um, trying to focus on equity and access. 
uh, as primary considerations. And um, really also want to say that we do support the ongoing research, uh, the FDA, and the work that's happening and other clinical trials, I think, can continue to lead the way and, and inform what happens with um, uh, synthetic psilocybin, MDMA, and LSD, but our kind of general discussions involve leaving the synthetics uh, to the clinical setting at this point, um, recognizing again that there are limitations to those clinical trials. I appreciate Jessica's point about that there have been uh, rigorous screening that have left some folks out that some of those uh, uh, situations I think can definitely be uh, evaluated. And um, I think there's a lot more that can be done around not only looking at at folks that have been screened out of the existing trials, but also maybe other modes of, of administration. And, and is it is it the, the MAPS model that they've been using the best, necessarily the most effective way to, to help folks um, benefit from these medications in terms of um, other psychotherapeutic approaches, or is the medicine alone potentially effective? So I do think there's a lot of opportunity for, for, further, for further research and definitely we definitely support that. Um, let's see. Um, I also think that there is opportunity for um, the legislature to look at a lot of things related to the board licensure issues that were raised, which I appreciate that conversation today uh, that, that's happened out in, um, in Oregon. And um, also about, you know, if we're going to look at, at, at access, uh, broad access in clinical settings and medical settings that health insurance companies are willing to, to fund um, access and, and what is that going to look like? So I think there could be a lot of opportunity for for legislative involvement related to how that would work. And I think we need to get you know clinicians involved, we need to get consumers involved, um, and we need to get the licensing boards involved, and, and, and certainly anybody that, that would be accessing uh, these services needs to be at the table. Um, as far as the ongoing uh, discussion about reducing risk of federal involvement, um, I, I think there's just been consistent um, input from our, our experts that we want to be non-medical um, as far as um, really um, really allowing broad access. Uh, we want to have it separate from healthcare. Um, we do not want to make any medical claims or adver advertise that, that uh, there are medical claims. Again, this is around uh, an adult, um, adult regulated use program. Um, we want to have it be responsible. Um, it doesn't necessarily need to be robust. Simple may be more the way to go to kind of, again, stay off uh, the, of the federal um, uh, radar. Uh, no interstate commerce, uh, so obviously no transactions across state borders. Um, there was some consideration to the Controlled Substances Act, uh, which prohibits uh, illegal drug use in facilities. Facilities, and so that's another reason, like uh, Dr. Marks, Mason Marks, emphasizes, if we can stay out of facilities, besides it being cost prohibitive, perhaps, but it does violate the Controlled Substances Act. And certainly, if you're providing the medicine, that's even further further violation of this act, um, which is certainly a consideration. Um, uh, try to avoid putting the feds in a position of having to state their position. Um, we had uh, Shane Pennington talk to us. Uh, he was uh, a, a big proponent of, of robust medical trials, uh, seeing this as a, a path to get more data and build out a medical pathway similar to what uh, has been done with methadone. Um, there was That was a significant divergence from our other medical experts, um, which were really, again, recommending that we move forward with a, a, a non-medical program um, and leaving, um, you know, the medical program to be a separate, a separate thing. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, Mason Marks also suggested we look at what's happening in Germany. Uh, they have an international system of cooperatives that test for quality. Also looking at the Netherlands, they have a very soft approach to plant-based substances. They sell truffles, um, uh, which um, uh, I think uh, something that again just uh, it seems to be going well. Uh, they uh, have consumer education at the point of sale and a very high level of prosecut prosecutorial discretion. So those are a couple of models that uh, he recommends we do a little more research into. Uh, there's been some discussion about the Office of, Office of Cannabis Management possibly being um, a way to help us administer. They could provide some in infrastructure. They obviously have their hands full with um, currently implementing the, the legalization of, of, of cannabis here in Minnesota. So it, it, it you know, isn't going to be on their radar anytime soon, but anything that we recommend is probably going to be a ways off anyway. So uh, that, but that is a conversation that I know that a, um, a couple of our, our um, task force members have been having with the, with that office. Um, we're limiting it to um, just natural mushrooms um, that are easy to cultivate and uh, really help that, you know, hope that this would reduce any risk of exploitation or colonizing um, indigenous medicine. 
Um, there's been lots of conversations about, and, and Ranji, uh, Ranji's been really, uh, I think, a strong voice in this around making sure that we are doing um, whatever we can to reduce risk uh, for, for participants that, that choose to use um, magic mushrooms. Uh, this could involve certainly a very broad public education campaign. Uh, again, you know, points of sale education, um, maybe some required demonstrated knowledge, you know, where people have to go through some education and demonstrate that they, they, have, they have an understanding of the risk. Um, maybe some screening where uh, people have this, a discussion of risk, education, contraindications, um, but, uh, and then maybe people qualify through some kind of an access card. So there's, those are all things that I think are just considerations, but I really want to emphasize that there's a lot of concern about that we are informing and educating and making sure that people have uh, you know, informed consent um, and screening. Uh, some conversation about state certified facilitators that could be an option for people to use. Um, and um, you know that we haven't had any conversations yet about what about what cultivation considerations are need to be um, storage supply. We are not in the weeds there at all. Um, that there's uh, Jessica indicated that you know there's some data about what's happening in Colorado regarding their um, adult use program that doesn't seem to indicate that there's been any public health um, or uh, health safety health or safety concerns. We did get some brief legal information about kind of arrest rates um, from the the, the 21 drug task force that operate in the state. Um, that's there for you to look at. There's nothing overly um, exciting there. Uh, not a lot of arrests, not a lot of activity. And then Adam um, did some research about what's been happening in Minneapolis. Uh, so we do have some data because Minneapolis did be prioritized um, last July. And uh, there's basically nothing. There's been, I think, one arrest. Um, so it's kind of been a non-event. So we I certainly think we do have some some data about what what is happening in a big city in our state uh, when we give adults access to to um, um, organically grown uh, mushrooms, uh, and also there's been some concern about well you know we just we just rolled out our, our legal program for cannabis and maybe we need to wait and see what's going to happen with that but you know 24 states have legalized cannabis I think we've got a lot of information about what that means so that that's it. Thank you so much, Paula, for that comprehensive update on the legal working group, and congrats on getting the, the working group chair role. <laughs> All right, so we'll move on to Adam. Adam, if you can give your update from the regulatory working group, then we'll take a 10-minute break, and then we'll come back and, and do a discussion um, about this and engage on mural. Take it away, Adam. Thank you. The regulatory work group met on April 8th and then April 24. I was only at the April 8th meeting, so I can kind of do the first part of this. For April 24, I'd be willing to tag off to Jessica, Donovan, Bennett, Michael, or NG. Uh, so I'll start with April 8, and then folks can see if they want to jump in. Uh, April 8 was really a small group. It was intimate. It was myself, Donovan, and Guthrie, and then Jess and Caroline. And it, it kind of allowed us to have you know much more of a, a just natural conversation than a meeting. Rising and briefly discussing the debate between Shane Pennington and Mason Marks and uh, kind of went back over different things. You know, one of the questions I asked Shane Pennington is what is the quickest way that we could help people who are suffering right now from diseases of despair, whether it's depression or alcoholism or opiate addiction and shane said unequivocally yeah the quickest way would be adult regulated use um you know he has a grander proposal about collecting data over the course of many years and working with the federal government similar to what happened with methadone back in the 70s and 80s but he acknowledged if we want to help people right now the quickest way would be adult regulated use uh we had an interesting conversation with donovan guthrie and i about uh, the history, you have like a deep history of the Ojibwe and Lakota people using either peyote or mushrooms. And it's, uh, my understanding, it's a little bit unclear. It might have been part, you know, there are vast trade routes going from South America all the way to Alaska. And it's possible that these substances were moving back and forth. But a lot of history has been lost tragically. Um, you know, Guthrie noted just from the native perspective, what we're talking about using psilocybin mushrooms is kind of akin to fasting. 
in order to reach a different state of consciousness. And whereas fasting may take two or three days uh, with psilocybin containing mushrooms, it would be a vastly accelerated program. We talked about possible like law enforcement concerns, danger. And my personal opinion is that the, the main concerns will be impaired driving, you know, driving while under the influence of psilocybin containing mushrooms, and then children getting access to psilocybin mushrooms. I appreciate that the medical doctors present likely would have additional concerns about contraindications and not being a good fit with people's um, prescription medication, or uh, if they have a uh, history of a psychotic disorder or first order relative who does. And Renji just spoke about that just a few minutes ago about screening is important. So that was a meeting I was at. And then there was a meeting on April 24 that I was not at and I have notes, but um, again, Renji jumped in. He had some pragmatic concerns about administration and he wanted to know what these models look like on the ground. So I don't, I wasn't there and I could like read the notes for people, but if either Renji or Bennett or Donovan or Michael or uh, Jessica want to jump in, that would probably be the, the best way to go for the right second regulatory group meeting. Yeah, thanks Adam for that review. Um, I think for the second regulatory meeting, you know, we were talking about what does, you know, patient screening look like? Who who can facilitate? Who could be authorized to facilitate? I know there's been discussions around what are the qualifications for a psilocybin facilitator? Can it only be a medical professional, a licensed clinical mental health professional, or somebody else? And kind of what is the barriers to entry for that? And what are we factoring in in terms of informed consent and um, protecting people's licenses? And um, I know there has been, you know, some concern around what does this look like in terms of the temperature of the legislature? I think Bennett is, you know, highlighting that issue around like, is any of this going to just be dead on arrival if we put it into our report and it's just going to get thrown out? Um, we don't really know. Um, and also trying to figure out what are some liability concerns? Like if there were something to happen, how are we going to hold people accountable? Um is it on the clinician? Is it on the agency monitoring it? I think we already have infrastructure in place in some of our state agencies that we could piggyback on, but we might have to think about creating new regulations specifically for this. Um, so I don't know if uh, Renji or Bennett or Donovan or anyone else that was at that meeting have additional things they want to touch on. Jess, I'll just say thank you. That was a nice summary. I think, and Adam, I think you sort of summarized exactly my points that I made in the group, was, which is screening, um, what happens when something wrong goes, who's responsible, who should be responsible, what does the informed consent process look like, especially for vulnerable people, right? Folks that may not completely understand what informed consent is. I mean, people need to understand, not just sign off a, a piece of paper. They need to understand what they're getting into. And so uh, that really just highlights my safety concerns, but thank you, both great summaries. Yeah, and the one safety concern I want to add to um, the the I think three that Adam raised is just the inherent um, the inherent risk. Not you know not so much on the the far end of the the risk spectrum with like you know potentially inducing psychosis in rare really rare instances, um, but in the, more more within the realistic realm of people just having an experience without proper support or in an environment where, um, you know, there, there isn't enough control and safety for them. And they just have a, you know, a bad or a really bad experience that really, um, shakes them or, or messes with them, um, for a while, because as, as much as, um, something like psilocybin can be, uh, ex you know, extremely, or even just kind of positive for people, it can also, it can also go in the other direction if the the support and the care isn't there. So that that's the other in inherent risk I want to add to the list is is um, just just the risk that that someone comes out of the experience having been been um, negatively impacted by it. Yeah. Thanks, Bennett. Hello, this is Donovan. Um, I think the the points I'd just like to bring up and reiterate is you know 
in our communities we're fighting and i think adam mentioned earlier you know advocating for people in a lot of bad states uh if it's addiction in if it's alcoholism or drugs or if it's mental health um issues and how uh i just want to keep it uh plain and simple as natural plant medicine and the psilocybin for the mushrooms and think about it in that aspect and we know that the the so are the the synthetics have a potential way to legalization through the medical field um i just have to keep on echoing what i believe in and what i feel um that could be helpful from the input that i gather and thinking about how it is you know that natural plant medicine that is going to be very helpful um and adam really summed up the conversation well and we just i just like to discontinue to echo that message thank you Paula? Um, you know, I just want to also say too that I appreciate the conversation. So I'm here representing uh, expertise in the in the treatment of substance use disorders. That's my my position is on the task force. And having been in the field for 40 years, I have not worked yet with one person that has identified uh, psilocybin as a, a drug of concern, which is curious. Um, I have talked with many, many people though that have found it to be life saving. Um, and sometimes even some of those negative experiences have been um, transformative. And so, so I also, I, I'm not trying to mitigate the safety concerns. I, 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 I echo them. And again, I think speaks to the, the thoroughness of our task force. Um, but I do believe we can mitigate those safety issues and they aren't a reason to not move forward with providing folks access to the, 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 the benefits. Um, and, um, and, and really prioritizing, um, you know, again, access and equity. Um, and again, at 40 years of practice, it has never been an identified substance of concern. And one, well, let me, I just want to put one thing on that, which is um, when, I, when I'm, was talking about negative experiences, it's, it's complicated, right? Because the negative experiences are often um, the ones that are, that can be most transformative for people, right? They, people in, in these studies um, and in uh, uh, qualitative um, accounts in the research talk about, um, you know, having really, really difficult things come up that they faced or that they understood better in some way that they then take with them into their life. And so that, that negative experience can be really in a way, you know, positive, but um, which is, which is true in, in real life, right? It's really difficult things can be really positive for all of us. Um, but that doesn't mean that something that's bad or difficult is always going to be positive if there's not um, the support and the knowledge there to help the person understand the experience um, in in a way that that can help them transform it into something good it can just be it, it can just be a, a really hard scary thing that that people leave without any sort of deeper understanding of of what lay behind the experience that they then can use to understand it in their their real life. And I, there's science on how people um, process pain and difficulty. And if people see it as something that's just being like inflicted on them and they don't understand why, they process it in one part of their brain where they're just trying to survive through it. And if they understand it, but if they understand it instead as, you know, something that's part of this process of them working through something to some larger goal, um, they, they process it in a totally different part of their brain and it becomes something that they grow and learn from. And that's like, I mean, the, the, anyone who's, who's in therapy or, or psychology or mental health here knows that that's an extremely, can be an extremely fine line and how to figure out how to move person from a person from sort of one camp into the other is a really difficult part of the process of helping people heal from, from trauma and harm and everything else. So that's, I, I, I definitely appreciate the, the nuance there. Um, I just want to be sure that it's record that we're recognizing that people can just have like really difficult experiences that do not lead to anything good. If there's, if there's not the support and the knowledge there to, to help them. And so part of what we want to do is the task force is make sure that we're, getting that that knowledge and that support built in as much as we're able to in our recommendations. Yeah. 
Thanks, Bennett. I do um, want us to take time for a 10 minute break. Um, and then we'll come back and have a broader discussion around this and engage on mural. There's four different sections on mural to engage with around this topic. Um, what are specific concerns that arise from the Department of Corrections, the governor's office, Department of Public Safety, Attorney General's office, et cetera, um, that make them these improbable? Um, when we're factoring in these work group updates, um, another box is around whether we should um, recommend this pathway of adult regulated use of mushrooms. Um, what concerns do you have around that? Um, the other box is should we treat each of the drugs differently in our recommendations, uh, given that they're at different stages of approval and can be made in different ways. Um, as we know, we can grow mushrooms, but you can't just easily synthesize MDMA or psilocybin or um, LSD. And then lastly, should we pursue decriminalization of all three drugs or just some or none? So something to think about. We'll return at 12.07, which is on the screen. So we'll take a brief break and then we'll come back and have a lively discussion. <laughs> Thanks. Hello, everyone. This is Jessica's voice here. Just giving everyone a two minute warning to come back uh, to the Zoom meeting in two minutes at 12.07. Thanks. All right, folks, it's 12.07, where this is Jessica's voice. So if we could come back to the Zoom meeting and the mural, and we can um, start to discuss um, some of these updates from the legal and regulatory working group around what we think about a potential adult regulated use program for magic mushrooms. What are some concerns that you might have? What do you think the full task force should recommend on this, if at all? Um, and should we pursue decriminalization and uh, should we regulate the three substances differently? So we can have this open for a discussion. I would encourage folks on the mural exercise if you could follow um, the MN icon on mural um, to orient you to that section. Uh, what section number is this? Section five. And uh, just use those sticky notes to add any questions or thoughts or concerns that you have and also just open up for the discussion. So I'll, I'll stop talking now if folks want to engage with Mural or just chime in verbally. I do want to encourage everyone to engage with this mural exercise because, um, you know, we don't know what we don't know from the different state agencies, particularly around any uh, pitfalls or concerns that you might have regarding some of these suggestions. And so, you know, we really need your voice to be heard um, to understand, you know, what are some of the, the, the ways that we can explore this and what are some things that might just be non-viable. I also want to point out that like this isn't this isn't binding nothing that we're talking about here is you know going to be a recommendation this is just to get us started down that path to give us a direction of where we're going to go. Yeah, thanks Jess. Yeah, we're we're basically just doing a research report covering all of our bases. Uh so what does this one look like to you? Yeah, Ari. Thanks. Um, I just wanted to offer that in terms of this question of should the task force recommend adult regulated use of mushrooms, I think the answer is yes. I think that um, even if you have safety concerns, even if you are worried about um, uh, unintended consequences, I think that this is the role of government and of public health policy to regulate unsafe projects. Like this is why we have seatbelt recommendations and why we have... Um, uh, you know, smoking cessation programs, because it's the role of government to help populations, like to, to protect populations to the extent possible that they can from um, dangerous activities, and that criminalizing those activities makes them less safe and more dangerous. Um, so, you know, legalization allows government to um, set policies around advertising, around minors' use, around um, 
supply around all kinds of different things that we just don't have the tools for right now. So yes, just a very strong uh, yes for adult regulated use. Thanks, sorry. I guess I want to echo that. And just, uh, it always strikes me as a conundrum when thinking about, you know, what's legal and alcohol, for example, is just so harmful and so very legal and easily accessible. And I think we need to consider like, what is public safety? What is risk? <laughs> and I think, you know, Caroline showed, even though it was in the clinical trial setting, that these things are very low risk. The decriminalization across the country has shown that it's not producing issues. As Paula mentioned, it's not really a substance of abuse. <laughs> Uh, for anyone, if it is, it's it's likely there's something else going on. It's not an addictive substance per se. Um, it's really just more around like psychological safety. And a lot of that can be supported through education and harm reduction approaches. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. And just to say like, there is no correspondence between the way that uh, medicines and other drugs are scheduled and their danger. It's just like, not a correlation that exists. Um, you know, they're political decisions about how these drugs are scheduled. Um, and, you know, when you think especially about harms, health harms associated with these different medicines, you can think about harm to self and harm to population. Um, and harm to population for things like alcohol is quite high when you think about like drunk driving. Harms to population asso associated with, with mushrooms or psilocybin is quite low. I mean, almost zero. Um, maybe there's some sort of drug driving that might occur, but not much. So, um, yeah, thanks, Jessica. Yeah, I don't know if everyone's aware of some recent developments where the DEA has just signaled that they are going to reschedule cannabis to Schedule 3 uh, based on evidence from state-regulated programs of, of, of medical cannabis um, and just the safety profile comparing it to other things like alcohol um, and other scheduled drugs. Um, and then... I know we've talked recently about the administrative exemption kind of being a non-viable option, but that actually happened for the very first time, I think two weeks ago, there is a church in Arizona called the Church of the Eagle and the Condor, which was able to get um, a Religious Freedom and Restoration Act exemption for ayahuasca, um, which isn't something that we're studying, but it's one of these like tryptamine based kind of similar to psilocybin and that it has a similar kind of core chemical structure produces these very intense altered states of consciousness because most of the RIFRA administrative exemptions that have occurred around psychedelic drugs have been, for ayahuasca specifically have been around these more like Christian based churches that are that are coming out of Brazil. Um, and that seems to be the benchmark of RIFRA is to demonstrate that the religion is close <laughs> to a sort of like dominant Christian type religion, whereas this was the first time an indigenous based religion on its own. Uh, was approved for RIFRA. So this might hold some implications and precedent for um, tribal nations to be able to do something similar on their own lands. Yeah, Ari? Hand wasn't up. Yeah, Paula? I guess I just found it compelling what Ari just said, that there's no correlation between risk and how meds are scheduled. Um, and I, that's, I think that's just unbelievable, but true. Um, and uh, yeah, just, just again, so just emphasizing that point and thank you for making that point. Really appreciating all of the mural activity. Thank you so much, everyone. Paul, is your hand still up or is that a remnant? I also want to say something about the um, the the new exemption received for ayahuasca by one of the non-Christian churches. Um, and actually, the, this is just a, a an interesting um, part of the history of the Native American church, which, of course, has uh, the right to use peyote for religious purposes. Um, the The word church in in the name of the Native American church is uh, really um it, it's it's doing a lot of a lot of work there um the the people that created the organization the native american church 
knew that for their organization to be um, recognized and accepted by a you know predominantly Christian American uh, legal system, that the word church there would just like let you know make it make it much make it be much more easily accepted, um, even though the the basis of the organization is not um, is is indigenous in, in its spiritual practices and and not you know not European or, or Western, and so it's it's just kind of a it, it's it's kind of interesting that the organization is called the Native American Church, but the it's it's church is sort of th throwing a bone to to American sort of Western American culture, um, saying like, look, we know you guys need to hear the word church to under to understand this as a religious organization. Um, that, that's just something I th I thought I would share because I think it's I think it's such an interesting. Um, I just I think that I think that's a really interesting part of the history. Yeah, thanks, Bennett. There's a really good deep dive on um, psychedelic churches trying to use RIFRA um, for this purpose um, by the Chacruna Institute. I think it's in one of our mural um, sections of resources. That's just kind of interesting to see how the government is trying to evaluate what is a legitimate religion. Um, so I think that's why I brought up the Church of the Eagle and the Condor, because they were able to do it without having to kind of conform to the, the westernized Christian Christian type of church. So we've got about three more minutes for this activity and then we'll move on to um, closing things down and adjourning for today. I uh, want to remind folks that the legal work group is meeting on Thursday this week at four o'clock and the regulatory work group, um, though now we're just the work groups uh, are meeting again, Thursday, four o'clock, and then I believe Monday at four o'clock. Um, and if you, now that we're combined, uh, if you, have been attending one and not the other and want uh, need the invite um, for a meeting, just let me know and I can add you. Um, and again, we may end up having, you know, once we get into writing recommendations, you know, they're going to be different. They're going to have different, you know, focuses and we may end up having to split back out. Go ahead, Paula. Um, I, I propose that we have one meeting, not two meetings. And maybe we need to resurvey the group, but we don't, rather than going forward with two separate meetings, that it just be one meeting as, as just the work, the work group. So okay. we're, we've actually been having about four meetings a month right. um, for the, between the two work groups. So, you know, um, it'll be, I mean, I don't know. I don't know how folks, how folks want to do that. Like there, there is a lot of overlap. Um, you know, we've got these scheduled out through the end of the year. And then we're adding in extras as the groups decide they want to talk about them. Um, so uh, maybe you and I can talk offline later. Okay. Well, I think we decided to have them become one group, not two separate groups. Then, yeah, I guess we'll have to kind of uh, re redo everything with that then. So um, I will put that on my list of things to do. Thank you, Jess. I'll help you. Okay. Yeah, I think it with Paula as the the working group chair now, I think, you know, we'll trust you to sort of lead that. And, you know, if we have at least two meetings a month that kind of are blending both of those. And then if we need to have more, we can schedule those as needed as folks have capacity. Does that make sense or sound good, Paula? Yes, that sounds great. Absolutely. Okay. Adam? Yeah, I would agree with two scheduled meetings per month. And if we need more, we can add more. And I'm happy to help in in whatever way, Paula. I uh, wish you the best. Thank you. Thanks, Adam. All right, well, we're getting about to that time um, to wrap things up. If you have any final thoughts to put on the mural around adult regulated mushrooms or other factors around decriminalization, um, please do so. You also have you know time throughout the week to engage with mural and 
um, for both this and the uh, recommendation of mushrooms in various forms um, under Caroline's uh, research updates um, and kind of how we want to think about this so that our working groups can kind of come to a consensus on what are the regulations that we might factor in uh, for some of these different programs. Um, so I want to thank everyone uh, for joining and engaging. I want to especially thank our uh, special guest speakers, Jason Ortiz, Dominic, uh, sorry, Mendiola, uh, Emma Knighton, and Mason Marks for joining us and providing their expertise on just what this looks like in the real world um, as we try to learn and evolve and grow um, as a state, as well as you know nationally as the conversation changes and new things happen every month. Um, it's really exciting and, and a little nerve wracking uh, to be doing this, but I'm really grateful for all of you and all of your engagement and participation and expertise in your various sectors and, and bringing your knowledge to bear so that we can come up with an awesome comprehensive report for the legislature. Um, I want to thank the public uh, for those of you that have been watching YouTube. Thanks for your attention. Um, our, our next meeting will be on June 3rd, I think. Is that right, Jess? What section is that on? We go to section six on mural, our next meeting. June 3rd. June 3rd. If anyone has any um, questions or comments, leave them on mural. Um, if you have anything between meetings, you can contact Jessica Burke or myself or now Bennett. Thank you. Congrats, Bennett, on your vice chair role. Um, we'll be sending you an invite to our debrief meeting. <laughs> um, and yeah, thank you everyone for all your attention and attendance and participation. And we will see you at the working group meetings and uh, most of you next month in June. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Have a everyone. Good Thanks, everybody. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Appreciate the time and efforts.